Good evening, respected chairpersons, speakers for today's sessions and viewers. First of all, on behalf of the Indian Pancreas Club, I would like to wish each and every one of you a very happy new year. Today's session is on the management of chronic pancreatitis, and we all know that this is one disease which is very difficult to treat and significantly impairs the quality of life of an individual. It sometimes requires a multidisciplinary team approach involving the gastroenterologist, the radiologist, endoscopist, endocrinologist, and surgeons. And therefore, we have curated this program for today's evening. And to take you through this evening's proceedings, we have very three eminent chairpersons for this evening. We have Professor Randi Su, Chairman of Gastroenterology from Medanta, Dr. Adesh Chaudhary, Chairman of GI Surgery from Medanta, and Dr. Naresh Bhatt, Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at ASTA CMI. So without much ado, I would like to request Professor Randi Su to take over today's proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Sudhita. And in fact, uh, it's a pleasure to be you know, joining this program. And uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, the next speaker, who, uh, who is uh, Deepak Gunjan, to speak on risk factors and diagnostic workup of chronic pancreatitis. As we all know that uh, chronic pancreatitis has gone significant change from diagnosing it at the end when there was evident uh, you know, chronic damage, chronic necroinflammation and fibrosis with endocrine and exocrine insufficiency, we are now trying to diagnose it early so that we can modify the disease. So we would like to hear from Gunjan that, uh, uh, you know, what are the risk factors and what is the diagnostic workup, particularly aimed at diagnosing the disease early. Thank you, Chairperson, sir. And uh, thank you, Indian Pancreas Club, for inviting me for this talk. And it's a very important topic uh, in chronic pancreatitis. I will talk about the risk factors and diagnostic workup. So it will be a snapshot, not very detailed account of the topic. So my outline of the topic will be risk factors, particularly alcohol and smoking, uh, acute pancreatitis, genetic risk factors, and some view of diagnostic workup. So if you will see the chronic pancreatitis, as we know that it is an inflammatory disease and has various manifestations, particularly pain is very troublesome for patients and also for physicians. And it is predominantly alcohol is a common risk factor for chronic pancreatitis. However, in recent decades, it has been changed from the disease of alcohol abuse. It has changed to disorders of com complex interactions between various environmental factors, metabolic factors, and genetic risk factors. So there is a change in, change in understanding of various risk factors uh, in chronic pancreatitis. So this is famous study from North American pancreatitis study that published in 2009. That is, it shows that alcohol, if you will see that very alcohol abusers, they have threefold risk of chronic pancreatitis. And similarly in a smoking, if it is goes up the back years, the more the back years, the higher the risk of chronic pancreatitis. So as the dose of alcohol increases and amount of smoking increases, that leads to the increased risk of a chronic pancreatitis. Similarly, if you will see here that in drinking category where teetotaler to heavy drinkers, if it is, you can see that it is increasing prevalence of increasing risk of chronic pancreatitis. So highest risk have heavy drinkers and very heavy smokers. They have a 13 fold increased risk of chronic pancreatitis. And in also in a smoking category also, if you will see those who have never been a smokers and increasing amount of a smoking back years, there is increasing risk of chronic pancreatitis. So the, there is a synergistic relation between the smoking and alcohol as the cumulative dose of alcohol and smoking increases, the risk of chronic pancreatitis goes up. Similarly, Dennis Cohart in 2090 also shows that as there is increase in drinking behavior, there is increased risk of chronic pancreatitis. And as we add on the risk smoking risk, so there is increasing risk of progressively increasing risk of chronic pancreatitis. And it is very long duration of follow-up, almost 20 years follow-up. There is one meta-analysis published that shows that as the alcohol dose increases, 
there is a linear increase in the risk of chronic pancreatitis so all these studies suggest that there is a alcohol is a significant risk factor for chronic pancreatitis there is significant dose response relationship between the alcohol consumption and chronic pancreatitis however the only 10% of a patients who are heavy drinkers develop chronic pancreatitis so there is a large gap of understanding between how alcohol causes chronic pancreatitis in some patients and most of the patient in does not cause the chronic pancreatitis so there must be some other factors like in a smoking this is meta analysis those who has ever time smokes versus no smokers the risk of chronic pancreatitis twicely high similarly in current smoker versus no smokers the risk of chronic pancreatitis is almost similar and those who are former smokers those who have left smoking and versus no smoking the risk decreases however it is still higher who never smoked and in all these findings are even significant when the it is adjusted for alcohol so it suggests that a smoking is independent risk factors for chronic pancreatitis we always thought that alcohol along with the smoking is the risk factor however now studies are showing that that the smoking is a independent risk factors another study that shows that smokers have higher progression of alcoholic chronic pancreatitis they have higher chance of calcifications and they diag they have diagnosed 5 years earlier they have diagnosed a chronic pancreatitis so if you will see a smoking a smoking doubles the risk of developing chronic pancreatitis in a smoking also there is a clear cut dose response relationship it is independent of alcohol consumption and cessation of a smoking decreases the risk of chronic pancreatitis so we should actively advise to the patients abstain from smoking smoking apart from alcohol so it's very important another risk factors is episode of acute pancreatitis there is a meta analysis published in gastro that shows that after first episode of acute pancreatitis the development of chronic pancreatitis in 10% however if a patient has recurrent acute pancreatitis the risk goes up to 3 times to 36% and alcohol in a smoking is the largest risk factors for chronic pancreatitis from acute pancreatitis progress to chronic pancreatitis so acute pancreatitis see particularly severe acute pancreatitis is important risk factor for progression from acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis the third important risk factors are genetic risk factors there are three pathways in genetic risk factors one is trypsin dependent pathway the commonly we know it prss1 serine protease 1 and 2 inhibit serine protease inhibitor kezal type 1 chymotrypsin c and chymotrypsin b1 and b2 other pathway is ductal pathway that this is the snr cell dependent pathway this is ductal pathway is mainly where the carbonate and uh, chloride secretions is happens the main genes responsible for cftr cystic fibrosis uh, gene then claudin 2 calcium sensing uh, calcium sensing receptors gene and trpv6 this is also calcium uh, channel uh, receptors and the third is mismolding depending pathway carboxypeptidase a1 and carboxyl ester lepis so primarily we know that trypsin dependent pathway and ductal pathway are responsible however now new data are coming for mismolding depending pathway that also that has trypsin independent pathway that leads to increase risk of chronic pancreatitis if you will see the trypsin dependent pathway they are interrelated the first uh, in 1996 it was described in familial hereditary chronic pancreatitis and if there is a mutation there is auto activation that leads to the auto digestion and chronic pancreatitis similarly chymotrypsin c variants that degrades the uh, trypsinogen however if there is a mutations it can't degrade it and there is increased activations and auto digestion the inhibitors as being one inhibitors that also inhibits the trypsinogen however if there is a mutation in the spink one it leads to the increased auto activation and decreased degradation of trypsinogen that lead to the progression of chronic pancreatitis so if you will see the role of spink one in meta analysis in idiopathic chronic pancreatitis and tropical chronic pancreatitis the spink one mutations has very 
high relative risk, high odds ratio of developing chronic pancreatitis as compared to the alcoholic chronic pancreatitis. In alcoholic chron chronic pancreatitis, a SPINK1 mutation adds to the development of chronic pancreatitis. However, the risk is less than the idiopathic and tropical chronic pancreatitis. This is the SGPGI study published in Gastro that shows that tropical chronic pancreatitis is highly associated with the SPINK1 30, SPINK1 mutations. And however, there is no clinical feature difference between those who has SPINK1 mutations versus no SPINK1 mutations. Another study uh, that's published in Nature Genetics, multicenter study, chymotrypsin C variants, this is trypsin degrading enzyme and in Indian patients also, the risk of development of tropical chronic pancreatitis was 13 times higher as compared to the controls in tropical chronic pancreatitis. For ductal pathway, CFTR mutations, we know if it is homozygous, dominant mutations, they present in neonatal age group. However, if it is low penetrance mutations, they will present as idiopathic chronic pancreatitis without symptoms of any lung disease or infertility. These are two landmark papers published in NEGM in year 1998 that suggests that frequency of CFTR mutation was higher in idiopathic chronic pancreatitis as compared to the controls. Another just recently published in Gastro that TRPV6 channel mutations in calcium channels that leads to the impaired clearance of calcium from the ductal cells, from the ductal lumen, and that impede the flow of the bicarbonates or fluid into the duodenum that leads to the formation of the stone formation. And this is recent development that calcium channel TRPV6 also cause the development of chronic pancreatitis. The third pathway is mismolding dependent pathway. In, in this pathway, what happens that endoplasmic reticulum, the enzymes goes from to the Golgi complex and then they are exuded from the plasma, plasma cell membrane. However, if there is a mutations, they will not able to form the gymogen granules. So what happens, there is an increased autophagy and there is a risk of development of chronic pancreatitis. So this is the landmark study published in Nature, Nature Genetics, CPA1 mutations, carboxypeptidase A1 mutations, and in also they have a included Indian patients, they have found that there is an increased risk of early onset chronic pancreatitis. And this is landmark also in the sense that CPA1 mutation has, after the PRSS1 mutation, it has a strongest penetrance. In less than 10 years, the odds ratio is at T4. So it is second strongest penetrance, penetrance has this gene mutations for development of early onset acute pancreatitis, uh, early onset chronic pancreatitis. The another, in, uh, another gene is carboxyester lipase. In European cohorts, it has been found to be associated with non-alcoholic chronic pancreatitis. However, in three independent Asian cohorts, including Indian patients, it has found to be there is no association with the carboxyester lipase gene versus chronic, in chronic pancreatitis. So it is ethnic specific gene that is particularly responsible in European cohorts, not in Indian cohorts. If you will see the Indian study, as we quoted earlier, one from the ENS that idiopathic chronic pancreatitis, when they have analyzed of, out of 400 patients, 242 patients has idiopathic chronic pancreatitis and a SPINK1 mutation was found in 42% of the patients. And also in alcoholic pancreatitis, 17% of the patient has SPINK1 mutations and CFTR gene mutations also. So in majority of the patients, SPINK1 mutation and CFTR mutations in idiopathic chronic pancreatitis in India is responsible for uh, chronic development of chronic pancreatitis. None of the patient has PRSS1 mutation. Another study that showed that Claudine 2 and MORC4 gene confer susceptibility in uh, Indico Consortium study, large group of patients and they have also shown that gene environment interaction, particularly in L, uh, with the alcohol, more C4 gene variants uh, in alcoholic chronic pancreatitis, if they have homozygous mutations, there is a 14 times increased risk of development of chronic pancreatitis as compared to the heterozygous mutation. 
So if you will see the development of chronic pancreatitis and if you will grade the risk uh, factors, the highest risk factors were in PRS, PRSS1 gene mutations and homozygous sp one mutations. There is low risk of a mutation like chymotrypsin C, and if there is alcohol, is the only responsible factor. They have low risk of a progression of a chronic pancreatitis. However, there is moderate risk if alcohol, along with various mutations, are responsible for moderate rate of a risk of development of a chronic pancreatitis. So, summarizing that, the risk factors: alcohol is the commonest risk factor, and a smoking is the independent risk factors apart from alcohol. Both is synergistic, both in epidemiological study and experimental study, it has shown that both work synergistically. And also acute pancreatitis and recurrent pancreatitis can progress to the chronic pancreatitis. Genetic risk factors, they are uncommon cause of the chronic pancreatitis. However, it has been shown that it can be synergistic with alcohol. We require further characterization for genetic risk factors. Coming to the diagnosis, so if you will see the model of development of chronic pancreatitis from acute pancreatitis till the development of a chronic pancreatitis, there is a stage of early chronic pancreatitis. This is the stage when patients are at risk of developing chronic pancreatitis, established chronic pancreatitis. However, it is difficult to diagnose. So why diagnosis is important that it relies on the relevant symptoms, imaging modalities, and assessment of pancreatic functions. However, problem with the uh, chronic pancreatitis diagnosis is that biopsy is very difficult. And also, it is difficult to differentiate early stage disease from the recurrent acute pancreatitis, where this is the stage where we can intervene and stop the progression from early stage to the in the stage of the disease. And also, there is a correlation between structural and functional impairment of CPS not very good. You see the CT scan, there is a marked atrophy and calcification, but patient doesn't have a symptoms. So there is a poor correlation between a structural and functional. So why imaging, particularly for diagnosis, apart from that in chronic pancreatitis has various form of complication, either pseudocyst, bleed, venous thrombosis or biliary structures. So we require imaging. If you will see the contrast enhanced CT scan, it is initial diagnostic test of choice because it is readable for most of the gastroenterologists also very high sensitive, uh, high sensitive for detecting calcifications and diagnosing chronic pancreatitis complications. However, it, it has suboptimal visualization of pancreatic duct. And in early chronic pancreatitis is difficult because most of the time the findings are normal. MRI with MRCP, it has weighted tissue contrast and uh, it have no ionizing radiation and it can diagnose pancreas division very uh, uh, easily as compared to the chronic uh, CT scan. However, it has low sensitivity in particularly in parenchymal calcifications. However, if there is obstructive dulcal calculi that can be diagnosed. Secretine enhanced MRCP is very higher sensitivity and specificity, but I am not aware of any Indian center that are doing the secretine enhanced, enhanced MRCP. The problem with the MRI is others that difficulty in interpretation and lack of widespread availability. US, there are various criteria, but most one is the most common is the Rosemont criteria that increase the intra observer. Uh, accuracy of diagnosing chronic pancreatitis on endoscopic ultrasound, the four parenchymal and five ductal features, more than five, if it is, then it is definitive for chronic pancreatitis. However, changes seen in endoscopic ultrasound are very non-specific non sometimes. And also, we don't know what is the natural history of these non-specific findings, what we found on endoscopic ultrasound, particularly in increasing age patient, if patients are a smoker, alcoholics or obesity, there are various non-specific findings that these, uh, what is the significance of these findings we currently don't know. Also the inter and intra observer variability is important limitation of endoscopic ultrasound examination. If you will see the meta-analysis, the highest sensitivity of the MRCP 96% and the US and ERCPS higher sensitivity as compared to the MRCP and CT scan for diagnosing chronic pancreatitis. For pancreatic function test, the direct tests are very cumbersome and very difficult to do, but indirect tests also, only fecal elastase is very commonly available, 
and fecal fat quantification is difficult to do and cumbersome however these indirect tests lacks the sensitivity in particularly in a mild mild to moderate pancreatic insufficiency if you will see the diagnostic performance of fecal elastase one in meta analysis the sensitivity is 77% and associated is 88% however miss rate of cut off if fecal elastase cut off is less than 200 microgram per gram the miss rate is 10% so in mild uh, pancreatic endocrine exocrine insufficiency it's difficult to diagnose so if you will take the diagnostic algorithm of chronic pancreatitis in typical patients having typical pancreatic abdominal pain or history of acute pancreatitis or recurrent pancreatic recurrent acute pancreatitis the contrast enhanced computed tomography is the initial investigation of choice if there is typical finding then you can diagnose it is chronic pancreatitis however if it is not typical findings on imaging however the symptoms are typical then you can go ahead with mri on mri because of a better tissue contrast and uh, uh, if there is a characteristic parenchymal and pancreatic ductal change on mri that are suggestive of chronic pancreatitis then it is chronic pancreatitis confirmed and even on mri if you find there is no typical findings of a chronic pancreatitis then you can go ahead with endoscopic ultrasound imaging so summarizing the diagnosis early cp is more difficult it the problem with early chronic pancreatitis is that there is no robust definition how to define early chronic pancreatitis and it requires further characterization and cct is the first imaging modality for its wide availability mrcp has added advantage because of better tissue characterization and better ductal visualization us definitely it is more sensitive and for early diagnosis but findings are non specific thank you thank you deepak uh, now we'll go to the next lecture and uh, uh, my colleague dr adarsh chaudhary will take over uh, from me adarsh are you there yeah yeah i'm here uh, so i invite the next speaker to for his talk please who's the next speaker roop jyoti roop next to yeah Yeah, so I'm just sharing the screen. Oh, where is my presentation? You're not very good at sharing things. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so uh, happy New Year and a very good afternoon uh, to all of you. Okay, so uh, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Garg and Dr. Sudipta for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts on the medical management. And as you would all know, uh, and as uh, Dr. Randhir Sud has also said, like with advances in uh, several technology and. different aspects now we understand chronic pancreatitis in a little better way and we try to treat them in a little better way so uh, if we talk so this is how i define uh, chronic pancreatitis a multi level jigsaw puzzle with several missing pieces and if we talk about the presentations there are three broad presentations uh, and all of them require rigorous medical treatment besides the endoscopies and surgeries and in today's talk i'll predominantly cover upon uh, chronic pain and if time permits i'll just touch upon one or two slides on malnutrition and pei and maybe we can follow it up later on uh, with uh, in the discussion so let me begin with this clinical prototype so this is uh, the story of a 30 year old male who has been a long smoker and he presented with recurrent abdominal pain epigastric pain that radiated to the back typical pancreatic pain imaging uh, a ct scan had shown a dilated pancreatic duct with a pancreatic ductal stone in the head and neck predominantly in the head and there are few uh, scattered calcification and, and this is uh, what uh, we do is a pattern recognition and we treat these patients not necessarily pancreatic disease other also we follow patterns like this patient has uh, a painful pancreatic ductal stone and he deserves a, a pancreatic ductal clearance uh, as one of the primary treatment modality 
but let us see why the patient had pain, why this patient had pain. So if we see uh, this cartoon, uh, just yeah, so, so this patient had ductal calculi, so he had ductal pressure. And now it has been elegantly shown that if there is a pressure in the pancreatic duct, it can activate the pancreatic stellate cells. And then his other risk factor, smoking, that itself can cause pancreatic stellate cell activation. Alcoholics do have pancreatic stellate cell activation. If the patient has a genetic uh, pancreatitis, so gene polymorphism, as uh, uh, Dr. Deepak had nicely explained, trypsin activation that can cause pancreatic cell activation. And this can cause inflammation, which in turn can again cause pancreatic cell activation. So cell cell activation is uh, kind of the central event, which leads to lots of free radical generation. I I'm not going into the details of this, how this happens because of the lack of time. But during the early part of the disease, the body has an immense capability to defend against the oxidative stress. So these are all the naturally occurring uh, oxidative uh, antioxidant defenses. But as the disease goes on, and as we all know, this is a relentless disease of relentless inflammation, progressive fibrosis. So there becomes an imbalance between the antioxidant and prooxidant state, and eventually a prooxidant state supervenes. And as it is very well shown, oxidative stress can lead to different kind of inflammation, both in the system and in the pancreas. And then this forms a vicious cycle of uh, cell cell activation, oxidative stress, inflammation, and uh, this gives rise to the relentless pain. So it's logical that at this stage, if we give the patient antioxidant that could help if the oxidative stress is reduced. Unfortunately, we do not have any medication at this point uh, that would uh, inhibit these cell cells in the clinic. In the lab, there are several molecules, but which has not been translated into clinical success. So the best we can do at this point is to try to reduce the oxidative stress with the hope that there is a reduction in the inflammation and that this vicious cycle gets cut off. And there has been uh, several studies uh, on antioxidant in chronic pancreatitis, um, but I'll just pick up two important studies. The first one uh, was from All India Institute, and I, I think this is the study with the biggest sample size of more than 120 patients, uh, published uh, around 10 years back. So this study showed that there was uh, benefit uh, in the patients in terms of reduction in the number of painful days, reduction in the number of pain episodes, and there was improvement in the oxidative uh, stress or marker of oxidative uh, or antioxidant defense in the plasma. Now, what happened three years after this study, another study came from Ajit Siruadena's group from Manchester, UK. Uh, it, it is uh, famously called the Anticipate study, and they showed that there was no benefit in these patients. And unfortunately, the Western practitioners go more by the study, and they were very skeptical of uh, using antioxidants. So if we dissect out these two studies, the Indian study, the patients were young and they were non-alcoholic. Majority of them did not consume alcohol. And I think they had no, they were non-smokers too. And none of them received non-narcotic analgesics. They received non-narcotic analgesics. No one received morphine. But if we look at the anticipate trial, uh, majority of the patients were elderly and almost all of them had alcohol and they were taking very high dose of morphine or other morphine analogs. So if we see this, there is a stark difference in the narcotic intake and the, and the etiology. And even in this study, the Indian study, patients who were taking alcohol antioxidant did not work uh, better than the patients who were non-alcoholics. So this gives us a, the right subgroup of patients who would be benefited with antioxidants. And these are young patients non-alcoholic and those who are not taking any narcotics. So this, this fits into very well into the Indian patients of chronic pancreatitis. We see uh, young patients, 70% of our patients have uh, are idiopathic, many of them with a genetic uh, risk factor, non-alcoholic, non-smokers. And we do not use morphine analogs often in India. So in Indian patients, antioxidants are beneficial. And then this meta-analysis uh, that we performed uh, with all the studies that evaluated the combination of this combination, including methionine. And that showed that the methionine containing antioxidant combinations had a significantly higher odds in favor of pain reduction. The number of need, number needed to treat was five. Anything below eight is supposed to be good. So why do I talk about methionine? Uh, if you see, I have put it in a red color. So I'm emphasizing on methionine and this is the reason for that. So, uh, 
this is normal physiology when uh, there is pancreatic activation there is exocytosis of the zymogen from the SNR cell into the uh, pancreatic ductules and this whole process re requires something called a transsulfuration pathway this is the transsulfuration pathway and it is driven by uh, methionine and glutathione so whenever there is severe oxidative stress because of recurrent inflammation for whatever reason this methionine cycle gets disrupted. There is loss of thiol group. So this to maintain this cycle, we have to provide thiol groups and thiol groups is provided by methionine. So that is why methionine is very essential in this antioxidant cocktail. Okay, so now let's uh, go to the next stage. So this patients who has pain and the, the, the disease progresses over time. So initially because of um, recurrent inflammation, these pain receptors will be activated. Again, I'm not going into the details of the neurobiology, but just to uh, tell you briefly, when these uh, pain uh, receptors are stimulated, this is the area of the pancreatic innervation, the thoracic 4, 5 to around uh, T10. So, so this is what happens. Like in the early stage of the disease, there will be radiation of pain, uh, transmission of pain through the celiac ganglion, and this part will be uh, relaying the pain to the uh, brain. But what happens when there is recurrent inflammation, so there will be a constant burst of stimulus. Constantly the pancreatic receptors will get uh, activated and that would lead to a hypersensitization. So now the, the spinal segments that will be involved are beyond the normal pancreatic segment. So if you see, it may involve up to the thoracic upper thoracic segment and lower lumbar segment. So this means that the patient will now have a wider area of pain reception. So the patient, if there is any stimuli anywhere in the intestine or even in the stomach, the patient may perceive that as pain. And if you see here, the, if, if the pain goes to the superior mesenteric ganglion, it bypasses the celiac ganglion. And that could probably explain in the later stage of the disease, celiac plexus is very poorly, it responds very poor. And many patients even actually do not respond to celiac block. So what happens because of this phenomenon, uh, we get something called spinal hypersensitivity, even with physiological stimuli, food in the stomach or intestine would give rise to pain or pain sensation. And that gets re relayed into the brain and the whole neuro pain modulation architecture of the brain gets altered. And there is another interesting phenomenon called descending inhibitory pathway, which is very active in a normal person. But in chronic pancreatitis, because of this neuropathy, the pancreatic and central sensitization, this descending pathway also gets inhibited. And in the whole scheme of event, there is only one molecule that is supposed to improve the central sensitivity, the descending pathway. So descending pathway gets reactivated. And that molecule is pregabalin. Unfortunately, there is only only one study so far that was uh, published around 10 years back uh, where the authors uh, from Denmark used 75 milligram uh, pregabalin twice daily and escalated to 300 milligram for three weeks. And those patients did show significant uh, pain relief, but there was also a placebo response of 30%. Even 30% of patients in the placebo arm actually responded. So, so this is uh, something that can be considered in these patients who has a long-term disease and who has uh, features of uh, neuropathic pain. But in the real world, the problem is how do we identify neuropathic pain in the clinic? So now uh, there have been a few recent studies like published this year itself, two studies from a, a consortium from UK, from Denmark and USA, uh, who studied uh, something called quantitative sensory testing. And this is uh, what is done in this testing, like the patient is um, stimulated in different spinal segments by uh, needle prick sensation and pressure sensation. And the patient would tell us when he gets the pain. So this gives us temporal summation, which is very characteristic element of neuropathic pain. And this is the uh, pressure threshold, uh, which becomes much lower in patients with neuropathic pain. But the problem is these are all research tools and it's not available widely. So what to do of then? So maybe we can take you from this brilliant study from gastroenterology published uh, several years back. Uh, what the authors did was, uh, so this is a control schematic diagram. This is the schematic diagram of a patient with chronic pancreatitis and they provided electrical stimulus to the esophagus, to the stomach and duodenum. So in response to electrical stimulus, this is the 
area of pain the patient uh, controls healthy controls uh, felt and if you see uh, in the patients with chronic pancreatitis the area of involvement of pain especially in the duodenum and gastric uh, referral area is much wider which means that this patients has neuropathic pain and they have more uh, widespread uh, areas of pain so so we can extrapolate it to our clinical practice so if the patient tells that his pain has changed in his in the character of the pain there is a very wide referral new areas of uh, pain has uh, he has developed new areas of pain in the body in the chest back or all over the abdomen so these are soft markers i am not saying these are very hard um, markers of neuropathic pain but these are soft markers that uh, can lead us to suspect is yes, this patient could have neuropathic pain and that could be quantified if we suspect that couldn't be quantified by something called pain detect this is a, a online tool available free in google and this has been actually validated for neuropathic pain in diabetic neuropathy and uh, radiculopathy and few recent uh, clinical studies have actually used uh, this tool for chronic pancreatitis also so if if the score is above 19 then we can pretty be sure that the patient has neuropathic pain and I, and i think this is a very useful tool that we uh, always use in our clinical practice and for some of the patients so let me take you back to the uh, clinical prototype uh, that we had uh, discussed so that patient uh, after he underwent esw and then 3 4 uh, pancreatic stent exchanges he came back with uh, pain recurrence of pain which was moderate to severe after 12 months uh, of the um, procedure and his stent was removed uh, around 3 months back so here there could be two scenarios so usually what happens when a patient comes back with pain like this he underwent stenting before so there is a knee jerk reaction okay this patient has pain he has a dilated duct we should put in another stent so so that, that that's a common tendency that we all have and try to put in stent and they undergo multiple stent exchanges that could be valuable or that could be true i mean that could be beneficial if the patient falls in the scenario one when the patient comes with that kind of pain it's very important to assess for is supposed to be a pancreatic duct structure if the structure is recurrent or if it's a persistent structure or if the patient has a uh, new obstructive pancreatic ductal stone he could have mass lesions he could have local complications like duodenal obstruction or biliary complication or um, compression of a structure by the pseudocyst so in those case intervention is beneficial he may be benefited to the pd stent or even surgery but the second scenario is more common where he do not have any of this and this patient already had the intact sphincterotomy the or if he underwent surgery lpj that is already intact the, the duct are clear or maybe have some very small soft floating stones so in this situation stenting is unlikely to be beneficial so we tried to answer the, and so so when we took history of the patient further so it seems uh, it turns out that the patient had prove that yeah. uh, uh, we had look at the time please yeah yeah so just just uh, three four more slides yeah okay okay, okay. Uh, so uh, he had a, a very long duration there was a change in the pain pattern and there was involvement of neo pain areas so uh, we tried to answer that question through this uh, randomized control trial where we combined antioxidants and pregabalin uh, for a period of 6 months and there was significant pain relief in this patient with this combination then finally what happens this patient uh, had uh, some benefit initially but then again he st uh, started experiencing a nagging kind of pain uh, which was mild with mild to moderate severe exacerbation in spite of pregabalin but there were no morphologic changes so this is where probably this uh, factors come into play the pain processing the pain memory the emotional response to pain and how he copes with the pain and when we took a, a history he was a it professional type a personality there was a history of a death of a relative due to pancreatic cancer and he was being an it professional uh, he had lots of google based knowledge on cp which is by far incomplete uh, without a medical background so these patients actually have lots of depression and again i'm not going to this complex uh, pictures but the severity and continuity of pain was in is independently associated with uh, depression and which is in the metabolites in the brain so these are magnetic resonance spectroscopy of these uh, patients and if you see here uh, based upon the degree of depression uh, there was change in the waves of the 
metabolites, which indicates there is lots of dysmetabolic changes in the brain in this patient. And the these metabolites in the brain correlates very well and very tight depression and pain. And what was more interesting was about the disease, there's significant improvement in the emotional factor depression, which is expected, but also in the pain score. So based on also what we believe is uh, this patient probably has more coping capability based on uh, their increased understanding of the disease. So this is my last slide. So. Uh, Many things have developed. I have not talked about uh, the metabolized microbiome, genetic factors that are associated with pain. And these are still in the early phase of research. So it's difficult to extrapolate them to the clinical uh, scenario. But the knowledge that is that the pain begins with um, pancreatic inflammation. And it goes on to develop central neuroplasticity. So at, at the later part of the disease, the patient has a combination of a nociception, uh, mean, meaning uh, excitation of the receptor, neuroplasticity, and neuropathy. So what we can offer this patient with this incomplete understanding that we have so far. First would be a very good pain assessment, the meticulous history of pain, the duration, the radiation of pain, referent of pain character. These are usually not asked in the clinical practice. So we just ask uh, the patient has a pain and there is a stone and we go for treatment. Then look for possible determinants his background knowledge at home for short and newly available are good choices. High potency opiates, morphine, naldofen, buprenorphine should be avoided because they have the tendency to cause narcotic bowel syndrome and they can also cause mast cell degranulation, which can later on increase the pancreatic inflammation. And in the long term, we need to give them methionine containing antioxidants if the patient has neuropathy at pregabalin. If no response uh, in my clinical practice, and I'm sure with many of you, deloxetine could be a good choice, even though there are no RCTs. Constant counseling and education of the patient should be an essential part in the treatment. And pancreatic enzymes, especially the enteric coated, are not useful in pain. And these are some general advice uh, to ask the patient not to st start smoking or take tobacco, both cigarettes and smokeless. In the Western uh, population, they do not take smokeless tobacco, so they don't have data on that. But my hunch is even smokeless tobacco, like uh, khani, um, is an imp important risk factor. So I'll skip the exocrine insufficiency part we can discuss this uh, later on yeah yeah i think uh, and i think we are moving into uncharted terrains and this is the acknowledgement all these people work with me and thank you uh thank you uh Roop. i think uh we'll have the question at the end the next talk is by amit to talk on endoscopic intervention in chronic pancreatitis amit all yours yeah, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're audible. Amit, you're audible. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. okay. So I'll go ahead straight away yeah, yeah. because yes, sir, I yes, think, uh, we're getting audible. quite delayed, quite delayed. So I'm going to talk on endoscopic intervention in chronic pancreatitis. And we just heard from our uh, previous two excellent talks about the varied nature of the disease. So I just want to tell you that whether you do surgery or you do endoscopic treatment of chronic pancreatitis, it's not simple because the disease itself is not simple. And as you can see here from country to country and within the same country from region to region, the whole morphology of how patients present in chronic pancreatitis changes. You can see here these subsequent pictures of chronic pancreatitis, see the different ductal morphologies. And this whole thing fits between two etiologies, alcoholic and tropical. We also heard from our previous two talks that chronic pancreatitis is not specifically related to any one specific cause. It's usually a multi causative disease. For example, just because you have a genetic mutation doesn't mean you'll develop chronic pancreatitis. Or even if you are an alcoholic, doesn't mean that you'll develop chronic pancreatitis. There have to be many other factors which play a role to make the patient susceptible to develop chronic pancreatitis. And this is exactly what we see. As far as our perspective in cl the clinical practice, the manifestations of chronic pancreatitis are, are these. They can have stone predominant disease or we have stricture predominant disease or you have a combination of stones and strictures. Some patients may have an inflammatory mass, some may have associated pseudosis, some may also have a biliary stricture. And our 
a decision of what to do for these patients usually depends upon what is the manifestation of the disease. Uh, all of us also know that uh, the main and established indication of any intervention to treat these patients of chronic pancreatitis, uh, leave alone the medical part, but interventional treatment established indication is relief of pain. However, uh, over the last decade or so, or maybe a couple of decades or so, these are the two evolving indications for treating chronic pancreatitis. First is, of course, improvement of the gland function, which uh, we have seen in some of our patients of endoscopic treatment, where we have established a proper ductal clearance and we have found exocrine, endocrine uh, insufficiency to have improved. Also, in some surgical studies which have been published in the past, they have shown this improvement. And therefore, there is a possibility that you can delay the progression of the disease if you treat these patients early. Uh, so therefore, these could be considered as the evolving indications of treatment. Well, the endoscopically treatable morphology, if you ask me today in 2020, are if you have a situation like this, where you have a dilated duct with stones inside it, or you have a strictures, which are not too many strictures, predominantly located in the head or body, not in the tail, maybe one or two strictures. And with evolving technology, newer techniques, nowadays we can also treat patients who have got an associated biliary stricture in patients having chronic pancreatitis, and of course, uh, these type of pseudocysts which develop in patients of chronic pancreatitis. It's very, very important that before you embark on endoscopic treatment, these are, I can personally say that these are mandatory uh, workup protocol which you should follow. First and foremost is you should always do a plain X-ray or a fluoroscopy on a C-arm whenever you are planning to do any treatment of chronic pancreatitis. And the reason for this is you want to pick up any radio opaque stones. Why? Because if you have, if you find radiopaque stones on X-ray, that means they at least have more than 400 Hounsfeld units of density on a CT scan. And these stones are going to be extremely hard. So if you want to embark on any endoscopic treatment, it is necessary that you have access and availability of a proper shockwave lithotripsy machine. And if you don't have ESWL machine and if you find radiopaque stones on fluoroscopy, there's no point in pursuing endoscopic treatment at all. In addition to fluoroscopy, the another important mandatory investigation is a good MRCP and maybe also an EUS or a CT scan. The main reason is to study the ductal anatomy because you have to know the ductal anatomy before you start treating patients by endoscopic treatment to know whether there are associated strictures, whether there are any pseudosis, whether there is any complex disease, whether there's a SOL. So everything you should have, you should have information before, only then you will have a successful result of endoscopic treatment. Now, pancreatic stones is something which we see quite commonly in India. Now, pancreatic stones are a little bit different from bile duct stones. The main reason is 90% of pancreatic stones are radio opaque as against bile duct stones. And why is this? Because they have got a high calcium content that makes them hard. Many times the pancreatic stones are speculated and sharp, and they, that is what they makes them makes the stones impacted in the pancreatic ductal epithelium. I know even for a surgeon to remove the pancreatic duct stones, even after opening the pancreatic duct, sometimes it's not easy. You have to catch it and pull it with a little bit of pressure. So these stones can be difficult to remove by endoscopic treatment until you do fun, some further uh, pulverization technique. Then they're also associated sometimes with strictures or a complex pathology. They may be inaccessible. In only 10 or 15% of the patients, you will find small radio opaque pancreatic stones or you will have radiolucent pancreatic stones. You see here, it was in 1989 that the importance of ESWL was stressed for the first time by Professor Nip Zohendra. This is the first publication on shockwave lithotripsy for pancreatic duct stones. And you see here, it was done only on eight patients. They had an extremely good result after that. And even today, after so many years in 2020, this is now the mantra for treating patients who have got pancreatic stones, which are radio opaque, before we embark on endoscopic treatment. So, so you see here, ESWL, therefore, now is the cornerstone of therapy if you find a patient of chronic pancreatitis who has got radio opaque pancreatic stones, you can see on an X-ray or a fluoroscopic picture. Nowadays, fortunately, because we have the fourth generation shockwave lithotripter machines, we can do this therapy quite accurately. It is very, very effective. We can achieve a pulverization in almost all the patients. And plus, these type of treatment modalities, are, that is the ESWL, is extremely safe without causing damage to any surrounding structures. You see here, what do you mean by ESWL? So when we do ESWL, we have to know that we have to achieve what we call as an end point of ESWL. 
So when do we stop our ESWL sessions? The end point of ESWL is pulverization of the stones, not just fragmentation, because these stones are hard. If you only fragment them, you will not be able to take them out by a simple uh, sphincterotomy and by a basket or a balloon. So by pulverization, we mean that you have to reduce these stone fragments to less than three millimeter size. And this is how we make them out on a fluoroscopy, loss of density, then the stone fragments start spreading all along the duct. And if you have only a single stone sitting in the head or maybe in the body, sometimes you may also have a disappearance of the stone only by a shock wave lithotripsy technique. So after doing the ESWL, only then we should do a ERCP. And uh, in this ERCP, all that we have to do is to perform a, biliary, a pancreatic sphincterotomy. Here you can see here, now that we are going inside, and then we opacify the duct, you can see that this is the duct which is containing pulverized stones after the shock wave lithotripsy. Then we perform a pancreatic sphincterotomy. You can already see that whitish pancreatic juice is flowing out with a little bit of stone fragments. And then a very good instrument to use for removal of the pulverized pancreatic stones is either a balloon or we can use a wire guided Dorbia basket because as I told you, these stones are hard. So if you use a, these balloon extraction catheters, these balloons break very easily. So the procedure is likely to become quite expensive. So it's better to use a wire guided Dormia basket, start by removing the stones from the head and slowly a few of the fragments you keep on removing until we can achieve a complete ductal clearance. If you have not achieved a complete ductal clearance, then temporarily place a five French tent inside only to act as a conduit. Call the patient back after three months, do a fluoroscopy. In case you do find some more radiopic stones, do a shock wave. If it is not there, proceed with a removal of the stent, further flushing of the duct and achieving a complete ductal clearance. Here you can see this is a publication in 2020 in EIO where it has shown in a systematic review and meta-analysis, the success of ESWL and ERCP in symptomatic pancreatic duct stones are extremely good results. The complete ductal clearance after shockwave lithotripsy and ERCP in almost 70%, complete absence of pain during a follow-up, also around 65%. You see here fragment, fragmentation of these stones also could be achieved in a quite a high percentage of patients. In some of the patients, 15% of the times I told you, you may have either small radiopic stone in uh, which is floating inside the dilated pancreatic duct, or you may have radiolucent stones. Now for this, you don't require ESWL. You can directly proceed with an ERCP. And even in such a situation where we have large, large filling defects inside the pancreatic duct, dilated pancreatic duct, large filling defects, but they are not seen on a fluoroscopy or X-ray. That means they are stones which do not contain sufficient calcium to make them too hard. In such a case, you can directly proceed with a performing a pancreatic sphincterotomy. And then we can also go ahead and do a pancreatic balloon sphincteroplasty. Here you can see we pass a CRE balloon. We dilate the pancreatic sphincter up to about 12 mm. In the bile duct, we go up to about 15 mm. But in pancreas, we usually don't ex exceed 12 mm CRE balloon dilation. And then after such a balloon dilation, we can pull out these type of large radiolucent pancreatic stones simply by putting in a balloon extraction catheter. And in many times, you can achieve a complete ductal clearance even in a single sitting of ERCP. However, to be on the safer side, we do leave in a small stent, a five French stent, just for a few weeks. Go in after a few weeks, again, take out the stent, clean the uh, pancreatic duct, just check that you achieved a complete ductal clearance. What about those patients who present with stricture predominant disease? This is much more difficult because this is what we see in those patients who have an alcoholic etiology. Most of the times you see strictures of various types. They can be single strictures, multiple strictures. They may be tight, soft, or complex strictures. So how do we treat? It's very important that whenever we do stenting for stricture predominant disease, it should not be an arbitrary stenting protocol. There should be some protocol which you have to follow and some endpoint which you want to reach. So the end point of stenting in a stricture predominant disease should be a resolution of the stricture. So when you take out the stent after a determined amount of time, the stricture should have opened up and the contrast should be flowing out freely. You cannot keep on placing stents uh, permanently in such patients instead of sending them to surgery at the right time. So this is now the recommended stenting protocol which all of us follow, which have been uh, published in the amended ESG guidelines in 2019. So what we do is, suppose you find a stricture of predominant disease, we directly start by placing a stent, either a 5, 7 or 10, whichever is the stent which is possible at that time. If you can place only a 5, you call the patient back after 2 months, try to go to 7, 
and then again call after two months, try to place a set 10. Once we can place a 10 for instant, we should keep that stent inside the pancreatic duct across the stricture for at least one year. And then we remove that stent after one year. And after one year, when we do a pancreaticogram, if that stricture persists, the patient should be counseled. We have to discuss with the patient whether the patient wants to undergo a multiple stenting regime or directly a surgery. If the patient opts for a multiple stenting regime, the maximum we can continue that is for another three years by placing multiple 10 friend stents, two or three 10 friend stents, and again remove them after three years. If in spite of that, the stricture persists, the patient should be sent for surgery. So at, after one year itself, the patient should be given a choice if the stricture does not respond to your 10 French stenting. Well, this story has become a little bit different because of the availability of these fully covered expandable stents specifically for the pancreatic duct. In some of the studies which have been published, a fully covered stent like this placed across the PD has been shown to be safe with a good resolution of stricture with good pain relief. However, let me tell you that these stents can cause problem because inside the stent, because of the flange, another stricture is likely to develop in the duct. So therefore, in the present context, fully covered expandable stents are not recommended for clinical usage in practice. It should be only used in the trial setting or if you're conducting a specific study. What about pseudocysts associated with chronic pancreatitis? You see here, these pseudocysts are a little different from acute pancreatitis. Only 9 to 10% of such pseudocysts are going to resolve. But the good part is 60% of pseudocysts which occur in chronic pancreatitis communicate with the MPD. So therefore, nowadays it is recommended that transpapillary pancreatic duct stenting is considered as the first line of treatment of these pseudocysts. These pseudocysts are not very well amenable for surgery too because they are small and they're located usually in the head. Multiple pseudocysts are likely to be there, but they're associated or communicating with the duct. So if you place one transpapillary stent, achieve a good ductal drainage, these pseudocysts usually regress and they will come down in size. What about bile duct strictures associated with chronic pancreatitis? Till now, to tell you the truth, this was considered as a contraindication of endoscopic treatment because placing plastic stents across bile duct strictures never worked as it used to work in normal benign biliary strictures in some of the selected patients. However, uh, after fully covered expandable metal stents have uh, come in, uh, there has been a study which was recently published, you see here in 2014, a systematic review comparing two methods of stent placement in benign biliary strictures of chronic pancreatitis. And you saw, you see here that technical success and clinical success of fully covered stents is much more than plastic stents as far as benign biliary strictures is concerned. Now, this, of course, is not true for other types of benign biliary strictures, but for chronic pancreatitis induced benign biliary strictures, fully covered expandable stents can be a good salvage procedure if these patients are not willing for a surgical treatment and a, a proper surgical bypass. A final slide, I just want to tell you that you can see from this that endoscopic treatment is very, very successful if you select these patients properly early in the stage of the disease when you have done the pre-procedure workup. On pre-procedure workup, if you find that this patient has got a complex pathology, multiple strictures, stricture predominant disease, alcohol etiology, tail predominant disease, these patients are better off by sending them to a surgeon rather than persisting on endotherapy and then later on failing in endotherapy. Uh, of course, it's also important to know that if you have radiopaque stones, it's mandatory you have access or availability of a good ESWL. If you don't have, you should not per perform endoscopic treatment and just keep on placing stents. Might as well send the patient for surgery. So this is the follow-up study of the randomized controlled trial of endotherapy versus surgery in CP from this Dutch group. You see here, this was published in 2011 in Gastroenterology. And the conclusion of this randomized controlled trial a long-term follow-up of more than 10 years shows that surgery is more effective than endotherapy. But let me tell you, things are not as simple as this study tells you. Because this study, if you, if you carefully see it, the numbers are extremely small. There are a lot of limitations, pitfalls, and criticism. All these patients in this study were opioid dependent. 60% of these patients were alcoholic. 80% of these patients had complex morphology. Wow. And therefore, endotherapy protocol was also questionable. Amir, so, are you finishing? Finish. This is the last yeah, slide. Okay. okay, thanks. Thanks. Great. Great. Okay. So, so therefore, what I want to tell you is if you select your patients properly, then only you can achieve good results with your endoscopic intervention. Thank you for your uh, patient hearing. And this is my take home message 
endoscopic treatment and an ESWL is the first line of therapy if you select the patient properly. Radiopic stones, which are more than 5 mm, ESWL first, less than 5 mm or radiolucent, direct ERCP, dominant PD stricture, I told you the protocol, post CP benign biliary stricture, ideally fully covered stent and pseudocyst, uh, fully covered expandable or transpapillary stenting is the first line of treatment. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Amit. Uh, that was a lovely talk. Now we move to the third dimension of uh, therapy. We finished medical, we've uh, spoken about endotherapy, and now I invite uh, Rati Singh for this talk on surgery in chronic pancreatitis. Good evening. Sandeep, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, the problem is I don't have share screen on my system. Why don't I have that? Uh, is the administrator? Sir, yeah, Dr. Rajni, it must be at the bottom of your screen. Just look at the bottom line. Yep. There's a okay. share screen. Yep. There's, yep. there's a share screen there at the bottom. Is my screen visible now? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Um, just a second. Okay. Uh, good evening to all the luminaries here. Um, it's wonderful to share stage with you all. However, I'll present a very simple snapshot of what conventionally the surgeons do and the way they think. Uh, to be honest, surgery for chronic pancreatitis hasn't moved very much uh, after the initial advances in the last uh, century. Uh, we have been moving in some directions, but uh, not as much as, as compared to endotherapy. So let me just go over uh, my protocol. My uh, brief was to talk about surgical management of pain. I'm, uh, I'm told that a speaker after this will speak about uh, surgical management of complications of chronic pancreatitis. So talk would be divided essentially into three headings, indications, procedures, and timing. Uh, so there are lots of indications, the predominant one being pain. Other complications also have indications of surgery, but majority of patients who come to the surgeon come for pain. As indication of surgery, intractable pain, recurrent pain, and opioid dependence. These are the three headings we normally deal with when we sit in outpatients. The problem is defining these entities, and that's where often uh, individual bias, uh, experience, as well as studies uh, don't really come to our rescue. Uh, for the youngsters, I would encourage that uh, pick up one of the recent uh, trials and use uh, their objective criteria to define these uh, terms, and that be useful in clinical practice. Of course, they are also subject to a lot of uh, bias, but at least it's objective things to go by. So that's the escape trial criteria, which they were used in their trial, which can be used by in clinical practice as well. Same is true for recurrent pain with poor quality of life. This is again, a very subjective uh, sentence. Uh, objectively, the escape trial defined it as does uh, three times in one year and one can use this in clinical practice if so. And same is true about opioid dependence and side effects. So what really would qualify uh, your patient to be a dependent patient or having side effects uh, as to, to qualify for surgery. When we sit in outpatients as of today, uh, generally the surgeons see four groups of patients. One is a patient where the pancreatic morphology was not suitable for endotherapy. And these are the patients where the stones and structures are exclusively located to the left of the, uh, of the spine or the duct is full of impacted stones, multiple structures, and the endoscopist didn't venture to uh, go into this patient. Second is patients uh, which are increasing in numbers by the day, and these endotherapy failures. Unfortunately, we still don't have a very clear definition, at least in the surgical parlance, of what really constitutes endotherapy failure, because every second patient seems to have a different definition, at least when I sit in the outpatients. And I put this here because uh, at least in the escape trial, they use this criteria. And I'm hard pressed to figure out a uniform definition of endotherapy failure across the literature. You look at different publications, different guidelines, and you come across slightly varying definitions of endotherapy failures. Um, maybe some clarity can be got on this as well. And then there are patients where the endoscopist decided that uh, after the initial attempt that no endotherapy is not possible. The last two categories are those patients who are either not willing to go for endotherapy, the scare of endoscopy, I guess, or uh, endotherapy was successful, but the patient is not willing to go for repeated sittings. This is the last two categories of patients. It's important to understand that when you put the patients in one of these categories, the profile of what your results you're expecting will change. And over this uh, presentation, that would also come into the, into the, into the picture. The usual patients that come to us, uh, gland packed with stones or the gland where the stones are mostly to the left of the vertebral column and the endoscopist didn't want to venture onto this gland. 
The surgical procedure is almost 100 year old, and uh, some of these are no longer in active uh, use. However, just to describe them and put them in various categories is important, especially for the students, because subsequent procedures are, were based on the older procedures. So broadly speaking, the drainage operations, the pancreatic resection operations, and the hybrid operations, which were the drainage cum resection operations, like the phrase beggars and burns. And then the last two, which is something which nobody really wants, wants to do, but when stuck with a patient with a small duct disease, these are the options we have, a V-shaped excision or a, a total pancreatic with dilated cell transplantation in some parts of the world. So when, when the surgeons look at a patient and de decide what surgical procedure is to be adapted to this particular patient, in general, as of today, uh, it's based on the morphology of the gland. After the indications are dispensed with it, the surgical procedure choice is dependent on the morphology of the gland. So a large duct disease without a head mass would qualify for a lateral pancreatogenoscopy, the most popular operation, uh, the partington russell modification of it. A large duct disease with a head mass in most instances of the Indian subcontinent would qualify for a phrase operation. Head mass of uncertain nature, where one is not really sure of what kind of uh, tissue there is, would qualify for a Whipple's pancreatotonectomy. A small duct disease with head mass, which is the kind of patients we very uncommonly seen in the Indian subcontinent, but occasionally see much more common in Europe where alcoholics with inflammatory head masses come with normal or near normal uh, body, uh, the, the ducts in the body of the, of the gland. They qualify for a biggest operation in, in the Euro, in European sub, uh, subcontinent. And a small duct disease where uh, the surgeon really doesn't want to operate, but is pushed to the wall. Uh, the choices are an SBK procedure, which is a V-shaped excision and, and anastomosis. Neurolytic procedures, which most surgeons would not do as of today, and in some parts of the world, total pancreatectomy with uh, let's say, transplantation. The first step in choosing the procedure would be whether you're dealing with the large duct morphology or a small duct morphology. Now, and across the literature, different definitions come up, are, are available. And this is important, especially for the youngsters and students where you get confused when you're going, through, going back and forth between publications as to what really constitutes a large duct disease. And uh, I think uh, a guideline of, uh, of uh, Societies uh, published about a year back told us that uh, final consensus seems to be that five millimeter or more is considered a large duct disease. So uh, large ducts without head mass, uh, something which uh, looks like in the CT scan would qualify for a lateral pancreatogenoscopy. The operation essentially consists of opening the uh, gland uh, on the duct uh, about a centimeter away from the duodenum on the right side and on the tail end on the left side. Uh, a wide open uh, duct is achieved, and then it's anastomosed to a rule limb of the jejunum. This is one of the patients which we operated, uh, wherein uh, you have an open gland and anastomose. Advantages are it's a simple operation, relatively simple operation, with a low mortality and morbidity, with quite decent outcomes, provided you stick to the indications. The disadvantages are that if you have even got small uh, undrained ducts in the uh, head and unsaid process, it's a bad operation for that kind of patient. And of course, you need a dilated pancreatic duct to be able to open it in the body when doing the operation. Second and the most popular operation is the phrase head coring and the uh, pancreatogenoscopy operation. So uh, when you have a, a kind of a inflammatory mass in the head and a dilated duct in the body and tail, this is the operation which is most popularly performed uh, in most parts of, uh, of our country at least. So that's the kind of anatomy you get after you code out the head cavity in the head and a, and a opened out uh, body tail duct. And that is an astomos to a loop of jejunum. There are modifications proposed by several surgeons as to the extent of coring that needs to be done in the head and uh, various modifications have given us various answers, but unfortunately none, none is conclusive. And most of us stick to the original uh, description wherein the posterior part of the uh, head duct forms the posterior wall of the cavity which is coded out. The advantages are, it provides excellent drainage of the head and unsaid process and removes what is so, the so-called pacemaker of the pain in the head. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be in a single entity, the pacemaker. It just seems like inflammatory uh, tissue in the head, which, which prevents drainage of the multiple ducts in the head and unsaid side branches. And hence, removing that allows uh, the head and unsaid ducts to get uh, well drained. And the uh, there is no division of the neck of pancreas, and this is a major advantage of the bigger operation we'll see later. There is a bit of a learning curve, especially for the youngsters, because you need to know technical details of how to pour out the head. And if not done adequately, uh, intraoperative, uh, intraoperative disaster can actually result. 
Ripple's operation is uh, is a bread and butter of uh, surgeons uh, who deal with oncology, pancreatic oncology, and uh, most of the tissue on the right of the pancreatic vein, uh, the portal vein, and SMV is removed along with the neural complex, and then the stump of the pancreas is lost most of the jejunum. Advantages are excellent oncological clearance, and it is familiar territory for most pancreatic surgeons who deal with pancreatic oncology. Disadvantages are a lot of pancreatic tissue is lost, so uh, there may be poor function partly because of this, as well as loss of the duodenum. And there is technical complexity in patients where a lot of inflammation is there around the pancreatic head and the neck. A biggest operation, uh, very few surgeons, at least in, in our country, perform this operation because partly because we don't see this kind of patients where there's inflammatory mass in the head and there is uh, the rest of the gland is uh, is uh, not dilated, the duct is not dilated. So code out cavity in the head is anastomose separate and the end of the uh, pancreatic stump is anastomose separately. A modification by his own pupil, Marcus Buechler, gave us a much simpler operation to perform wherein you did not have to divide the neck of the pancreas. The advantages are the original series and subsequent series have given us excellent results in terms of pain relief in alcoholic chronic pancreatitis with inflammatory mass in the head. The disadvantages are it is a technically complex operation with a moderate learning curve and requires a division of the neck at least in the classical operation. The distal duct is not addressed at all. Small duct disease, I will not go into details of this particular set subset because it is a difficult disease to treat for surgeons. Um, originally, uh, various operations like the neurolytic operations and the V-shaped excision, which was described as the Izbiki operation was described. Results were not, not good at all. And subsequently, for the last couple of decades, total pancreatomy in some parts of the world has become the norm for these patients. And uh, the pain relief as well as the opioid free rate, uh, at least in one of the recent uh, reviews, was, was quite good for the, this subset of patients. When you compare uh, the majority of operations uh, done for this, uh, for inflammatory mass in the head, it seems that even though bigger gives us uh, good outcomes, the cumulative scores of quality of life and pain relief seems to be the best for the phrase operation. And that is why this is probably the most popular operation for chronic pancreatitis coming to surgeons. Second, and uh, briefly, a very important aspect of how to time your surgery. And this is becoming a, a bit of a headache for, for at least people who would be more discerning about what constitutes early surgery. And therefore, I just want to touch upon this in the next few slides. Now, early surgery was essentially defined, uh, at least in the context we are talking about here, for pain relief. And this has been propagated more and more in the last decade. So we have to really understand in terms of pain relief, what is early surgery and why is it advocated? Uh, especially for the younger people, this is important because it was believed, and I think Rup Jyoti has given us a very nice uh, idea of why uh, you have to intervene in a patient for pain relief before the neuroplastic changes appear or neuropathic pain appears, or at least in a, to a majority of extent. Uh, in a lot of patients, when they face prolonged severe pain and use opioids, abuse opioids for a long time, it seems that is one of the factors for promoting these neuroplastic changes and promoting neuropathic pain in these patients. Hence, the context of early was in this context, which means that before you uh, before you leave the patient for a long duration time with severe pain, that is early after failure of medical therapy, and before you put the patient on years of opioid therapy, you should operate the patient or at least intervene in that patient. And therefore, you will have good results before a significant amount of neuropathic pain appears. There is a misinterpretation to this early business, and that is why I put this slide here. It is not meant to preserve pancreatic function. However, uh, quite a few of us uh, would like to believe that it preserves pancreatic function. We are still struggling even after half a century to prove conclusively that it preserves pancreatic function. The most recent guidelines uh, of multiple societies a year back told us categorically that endocrine function is definitely not preserved. And there's a big question mark even on exocrine function because of the way exocrine function is, is defined in most studies. Uh, just defining and saying that the state variant improve is not really a good scientific way of saying that my exogen function improved. That's my perspective of the whole issue. Unfortunately, this is misinterpreted and that's where you want to be careful because that's when, if you misinterpret this, morphology rather than symptom becomes the indication of surgery and as well as uh, endotherapy. And the assumption there is that early surgery and early intervention can change natural history of disease. And as I said, I would be really love, love to be proven wrong on this, that uh, we are still struggling after a host of decades to prove that it can actually change the natural history of the disease. Um, and therefore, uh, 
but uh, sometimes misinterpretation of early, as early as possible in the disease course uh, is meant to indicate that you can intervene regardless of the presence or the severity of symptoms. I think Dr. Parugar had told us about a host of ways pain manifests. It's important to give you a, a snapshot here of what we are really treating. Out of all this, we are treating only this. And that is why it's very important to understand the kind of patients we treat or operate or intervene on, whether the patient is actually going to benefit. Uh, what predicts failure of surgery? This is important to understand that patients who have a very long duration of disease, patients who have abused opioids for a long time, and even patients who have had multiple endotherapy sessions, and this is one of the publications which put us there, uh, are going to have not so good results in terms of pain relief after surgery. And why is that so? Well, it's because possibly long duration of severe pain causes um, hyperalgesia, pain sensitization, allodynia, and this is further potentiated by prolonged opioid use. And if you ask the surgeon now to give excellent result after surgery, this kind of patients, he is not probably going to be successful. And same is true for opioid use. In addition, you have problems of addiction and side effects, including malnutrition. And again, the problems of multiple endotherapy sessions, wherein we have now delayed the uh, patients who have benefited are excellent, but patients who have not benefited, you delayed surgery by a substantial bit in a patient who is now having severe pain continuously for a long time, as well as possibly abusing opioids. So that's the cocktail of, of a patient who is not going to have good results after any surgery. In addition, and Dr. Chaudhary is probably one of the first few ones who have described this. When we operate patients who have had multiple endotherapy sessions, we do we deal with uh, polymicrobial growth in the pancreatic juice, and we have quite a few infective complications in this subset of patients. And this has been an experience from quite a few surgeons across the world now. The escape trial needs to be mentioned, and the reason for that is that it compared surgery versus the step-up approach. Mind you, this was designed to deal with patients who were suitable for endotherapy and hence randomized into these two subsets. And the inclusion criteria include patients wherein uh, patients uh, were having painful pancreatitis but had not uh, been on prolonged op opioid therapy, only a very short term opioid therapy. And the outcome was thus that they integrated his BK score in the primary outcome uh, at one and a half years. The early surgery uh, show, uh, showed us much better outcomes even though and this was a secondary outcome and the sample size was not determined to answer this question, you still have a 20% difference between the two arms, between the surgical arm as well as the endoscopic arm, the surgical arm in 58%. Uh, the p-value was insignificant possibly because, because the sample size for this particular outcome was not calculated. So where are we? One of the last slides I have. Well, I would love to say that surgeons are all uh, encompassing and we can treat everything. Uh, but one would, one would really, you can't really ignore the elephant in the room and that is to say that there are substantial number of patients who do benefit in terms of pain after endoscopic treatment. From the surgical perspective, the only problem we face as surgeons is we don't know which patients because it seems that the goalposts of who benefits from endoscopic treatment seems to be shifting every day. And hence, uh, sitting in the clinic, uh, it becomes a big nightmare to decide which patients to operate and which patients not to operate. So there is a subset of patients that is very clear. We still are trying to define which subset which are suited for endotherapy. And then there is a subset of patients which are not suited for endotherapy and definitely for surgery. And then there's a huge gray area in between where we are still struggling for answers. And that's where problem starts because both endoscopists and surgeons want to dabble into this area. Uh, fortunately for the surgeons, we have had history on our side and therefore we can offer a treatment which has been validated over almost a century. Unfortunately for endoscopists, this is where problem starts when patients don't benefit in this subset and then they are sent for further aggressive treatment. I think there is uh, room to do, um, uh, to do much more uh, control studies in this particular area. Not much to summarize. Uh, uh, I, would, I haven't put it here, but I would like to put point out uh, to the surgeons in the audience about uh, the role of uh, upcoming uh, minimal and access surgery for chronic pancreatitis. It seems that uh, like rest of the uh, of the body, uh, body sorry, abdomen is also going, is going that way. However, must understand the fact that uh, surgery for chronic pancreatitis is one of the areas where haptic sensation plays one of the major roles in determining how to conduct that surgery. And this is what we teach to youngest uh, surgeons when we uh, offer them. 
Unfortunately for us, even today, minimal access surgery and robotic surgery is still uh, way, way out uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from giving us haptic sensation. And hence, uh, we might not see very good results, uh, at least uh, in the current era. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajneesh. We now have the other surgical perspective on uh, management of complications. And uh, we have Dr. Saluja to do the job for us. Dr. Sandeep? Yeah. Is my screen, uh, am I audible? You are, you are, loud and clear. So my mandate for the evening, good evening everybody, and my mandate for the evening is to talk about the surgery for the complications in chronic pancreatitis. And why do we need to talk about that is because chronic pancreatitis, the complications are common and the outcome of the surgery for the pain at times would depend upon these complications. These complications may nullify the outcome of pain and at times you need to have to add the procedures which might be changing for the pain if the complications are coexisting. As you see the chron in chronic pancreatitis, the complications are because of the inflammatory process which may extend from the gland of pancreas to the adjacent organs. And the complications, the most common one is the biliary tract and biliary tract obstruction is most common among them. Followed by pancreatic head mass, or a presence of malignancy, and if there is involvement of the SP axis, the great, patients great may talk, develop like portal hypertension. Great, great talk. Very, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Actually, slides are very nice. And uh, Rajin, thanks. actually, can you just, because there's a panel discussion after this thing, is a duplicating whatever we have talked actually right now. And at times, these, uh, uh, these yeah, duct yeah, disruption yeah, can lead up to. Yeah, yeah, because please 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 basically, headmaster could change and the panel discussion like that. Rao, could you please but again, it's covering what all both of you have covered right now. Dr. Rao, could you please mute yourself? So, so uh, the, it can go on to the duodenal obstruction, and if there is involvement of the vessels, it can lead to pseudoaneurysm. Most common complication in chronic pancreatitis is biliary obstruction, and the incidence of that varies from 3 to 46%. And it is because there is a variable presentation in literature, reported in literature, it could be asymptomatic to overt jaundice and cholangitis. And the, Biliary obstruction is reported in chronic pancreatitis based on the history of jaundice, whether there was a raised alkaline phosphatase, whether there was the presence of dilated CBD. So there is a variable presentation. Now it is what is the most important thing is to differentiate from a malignant cause. If you see the patient is presenting with waxing and waning jaundice, or if the patient has no change in the nature of pain or weight loss, if the imaging finding shows that there is an isodense mass, and there is a duct penetrating sign, it supports a benign etiology. And vice versa, there would be a malignant stricture. Why is it important? Because if you are dealing with a suspicion of head mass, then the procedure for choice in biliary obstruction with chronic pancreatitis with malignant suspicion is a sectional procedure in form of Whipple's spray, pancreas preserving, cellulose preserving pancreaticotunectomy. As you can go perform a biliary enteric anastomosis in these patients. If you see, this is a picture which shows MRCP. There is a long stricture. It's, it is showing a tapering with a proximal dilatation, which is suggestive of a benign stricture. In the, in the picture adjacent to that, you can see a head mass. If there is an uh, area of hypodense, then you suspect that this would be a, a malignant mass. Although many, very investigations and everything has been there, but none of them is foolproof that you would say that this is going to be a benign or a malignant nature. So whenever you have a suspicion for a malignancy, you have to proceed for a resectional procedure. In case in the biliary obstruction, what is more common is uh, if you have an isolated raised alkaline phosphatase, and this can be further classified into whether it's a progressive type or if it is a non-progressive type. It is said that if there's a non-progressive type, it is a relative indication for biliary drainage especially if the patient is undergoing a pancreatic drainage surgery. If the patient is having a progressive increase in alkaline phosphatase, this would be an indication for adding the biliary drainage or doing a biliary drainage in chronic pancreatitis. What if there is a presence of jaundice 
it's just an indication for surgery this jaundice has to be classified as either transient recurrent or persistent the transient jaundice is usually because of acute pancreatitis acute on chronic pancreatitis and these usually resolve as the inflammatory sub process subsides and if you have a jaundice which is persisting for more than 4 weeks it is defined as a persistent jaundice and these patients should undergo surgery of a biliary drainage and recurrent jaundice is defined if you have this recurrent episodes of jaundice now if you see our own uh, we uh, uh, we publish this for isolated raised alkaline phosphatase do we undergo surgery in these patients we divided them into a progressive and a non progressive type and we found that we did not perform a biliary drainage in the post operative two of these patients developed jaundice to subside on its own and in long term only two out of these 15 patients required surgery and this we did because in 1990s fore said that if you these isolated chronic uh, alkaline raised alkaline phosphatase this could go on to spur cirrhosis in 7.3% of these patients but this is not actually completely true and people used to disagree with it so the indication of surgery with biliary obstruction include persistent jaundice presence of cholangitis fair evidence of developing cirrhosis on biopsy if your inability to exude the pancreatic cancer if there is a persistent elevation of alkaline phosphatase with a cbd dilated more than 12 mm the next important thing is that what to do so the surgery either a biliary anastomosis or a duodenum preserving pancreatic head dissection or a whipples they already told if you have a uh, doubt of malignancy whipples is a procedure of choice otherwise biliary enteric anastomosis is sufficient in these patients the two most common procedures are cholecoidectomy and cholecoidectomy now there is also that sometimes if you do a phrase procedures and you're doing a coring and the cbd is open this can be done and but it is not very popular because this may these strictures may recur in these patients also in the early early we know that when the coring was done one used to do an intraoperative cholangiogram to see whether the cbd has been opened up in these patients then i rarely use these days because more effective procedures are available we talk about cholecystogenostomy it is associated with high failure rate while transjuvenal sphincteroplasty is ineffective in patients for biliary drainage for chronic pancreatitis because the strictures are usually long now if you compare cholecystogenostomy with cholecystogenostomy there is no significant difference with a similar failure rate however the cholecystogenostomy the advantages as that the bile is not diverted it is easy to reconstruct and the jejunum extra jejunum is not required but at the same time it has got a disadvantage of some syndrome which leads to recurrent cholangitis if the patient is having uh, duodenal obstruction duodenum is not feasible to be an astomos and if ever there is a leak these leaks are more detrimental while cdj has these advantages at the same time if you have an extra jejunal loss since the patients with chronic pancreatitis are likely to develop steatorrhea this might have a disadvantage however the decision is basically based upon whether what is the size and condition of the cbd whether there is a presence of associated duodenal obstruction whether you coexistently require pancreatic drainage surgery this determined whether you go for a cholecystogenostomy or cholecystogenostomy now the next complication is duodenal obstruction which has an incidence of 1.2% an isolated duodenal obstruction is actually rare and there are two types one is acute transient obstruction which is usually secondary to mucosal edema and these patients can be managed conservatively while this is a persistent fibrous stenosis which requires drainage and you see the incidence of patients requiring drainage in chronic pancreatitis for duodenal obstruction is less than 5% and this incidence actually increases to 12% in case you see a surgical series and when you see patients with associated biliary complication they 25% of the patient might require surgical treatment and the surgical procedure is a simple gastrogejunostomy which can be added with a rigotomy while gastrogejunostomy can be done but when the duodenum is diseased it is preferably avoided you can add on to duodenum preserving pancreatic head dissection if there is associated biliary complication in these patients the next common complication associated with common chronic pancreatitis is portal hypertension and this is as a result of inflammatory process being transmitted onto the sp axis 
which can either lead to total or a subtotal occlusion of HP axis. The incidence of HPVO is 5 to 10 percent, which is the common cause of secondary EHO. And it's important to remember that resectional procedures, if performed for chronic pancreatitis, these can prevent this late complication because the inflammatory process and the fibrosis to the adjacent structure can be abated. But what is important in portal hypertension is it is although asymptomatic, but it has impact surgery is being taken for chronic pancreatitis. Surgery in these patients could be more difficult. It is associated with greater blood loss. And the resectional procedures are preferably avoided if you are treating a patient with chronic pancreatitis with portal hypertension. And in case these patients have got extensive collaterals, which precludes the safe drainage, which procedures can be formed performed, that is, you perform a shunt surgery followed by a drainage procedure. But like in biliary surgery, pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, this is rarely required. And the more common form of portal hypertension is the sinistral portal hypertension that is secondary to involvement of the splenic pain, which has got a very high incidence of 2 to 45%. And if you see endoscopy, the presence of varices are there in 17 to 55% of these patients. And most of these patients actually have got a gastric varices. However, they only bleed in one fifth of the conditions. And if you have to manage these patients, if they are bleeding, then the spinectomy is the treatment of choice. If these patients do not have a history of bleed, they can be observed. Now, the problem is only when you are performing a pancreatic procedure for a pain, whether you should act, add spinectomy to that, that remains a controversial, although literature do support that spinectomy can be added in these patients. But one should remember that spinectomy can increase the morbidity of surgery in these patients. Now, this is a CT scan wherein you can see the collateral seen in the abdominal wall and the gastric wall, which are indirect events that this patient could be having, along with chronic pancreatitis, a splenic vein thrombosis. Now, the other complication, vascular complication, is pseudoaneurysm. The pseudoaneurysm in this CT is being shown in the splenic, splenic artery. Four to 10% of the patients with chronic pancreatitis develop this complication, and the most commonly involved arteries are splenic artery or a gastrodunal artery. Management of the first line management of this patient is actually transcatheter embolization or stenting. When the patients are unstable, they require surgery. The surgical procedure of choice is bipolar ligation or resection. Now, pancreatic duct disruption is very common in chronic pancreatitis. This can either result in pseudocyst pancreatic ascites. And in these patients also nowadays, the first line of management as shifted towards medical the intervention plus the intervention in the form of ERCP. And in case the surgery is required for pancreatic ductal destruction, if they are located distally, one can do a pancreatic or jejunostomy or a distal pancreatectomy, which can be difficult in a setting of a chronic pancreatitis. And the proximal the proximal site is the cause of leak Pancreatic genostomy is the treatment of choice. Now, these patients, patients with chronic pancreatitis, can form pseudocyst, and it is very important to remember the ego classification for these patients because in these chronic pancreatitis can either have a type two pseudocyst that is acute on chronic pancreatitis setting, and they can also have a chronic pseudocyst where the management would vary. In the presence of acute on chronic pseudocyst the indication would remain same, although the medical management, although the uh, endoscopic treatment is now the first line of treatment. It is the patients who have got associated dilated CBD, a pancreatic duct. These patients would actually benefit. These are the subset of patients where the endoscopic treatment would have a higher failure rate. In this patient, the cyst could be drained along with an LPJ, which has got a higher success. Uh, to summarize, the complications associated with chronic pancreatitis are common. Biliary obstruction is most common, which require treatment, followed by splenic vein thrombosis, which may be asymptomatic. Recognition of these complications is important while carrying out the surgery for pain, as it contributes to overall improvement in outcome in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Saluja. I think we can start off with some questions. I think the first set of questions um, relate to genetics and chronic pancreatitis. Uh, so, Gunjan, would you like to tell us when would you do um, these genetic tests and what is the benefit of doing these tests? 
So genetic testings usually require if a patient has early onset idiopathic chronic pancreatitis, particularly less than uh, some guidelines say less than 25 years, some guidelines say less than 35 years. So idiopathic chronic pancreatitis, they are a subset of a patient. Along with that, if any patient has a family history of a chronic pancreatitis, particularly in first degree and second degree of a chronic pancreatitis, or any child uh, or patients having chronic pancreatitis. So these are the patients who require genetic testing. Particularly if a patient has alcoholic chronic pancreatitis diagnosed, they do not require uh, genetic testing. However, we know that in subset of patients of alcoholic chronic pancreatitis do have some genetic uh, mutations that contribute to the development of a chronic pancreatitis. However, the other point is important is that if any patient has genetic mutation, it doesn't mean that patient will develop chronic pancreatitis also. So subset of a patients that require genetic testing, idiopathic chronic pancreatitis. And family but does it materially change management in any way? How does it, um, how does it benefit the patient? I mean, to put it very simple. So uh, it's very important questions you require to counsel the patients particularly in hereditary pancreatitis, definitely it will change the management that these patients require surveillance. Otherwise, the management will not change too much by diagnosis of uh, genetic testing. However, it will end the repeated investigations if patient has uh, uh, coming up again and again, pain abdomen and having some complications, you will, uh, if genetic testing is positive, then you will not require further investigations. What is the cause of pancreatitis? I think we are question for you, Amit. Uh, is behind time, I think. Naresh, we should have one maybe two questions we'll take two. because there are two questions on the chat box. Only Amit, um, are you there? What do you Amit, more when what would you, you call uh, endotherapy a failure? Because you've discussed this time frame that we keep on doing procedures and then the surgeons say it's too late in the game or neuropathic uh, pain sort of supervenes. So when as a kind of rule of thumb, when would we say this is enough? See, you can define that only if you have some endpoints when you do endotherapy. You cannot keep on doing endotherapy. You have to decide some endpoint. For example, when the stone disease, the endpoint for stone disease endotherapy is clearance of stones. Now, after clearance of stones, <laughs> if the patient is reasonably pain-free, then that is a completion of endotherapy. But in spite of stone clearance, if the patient continues to have pain, then you, don't, you cannot just keep on placing stents when there is no ductal obstruction. So then you have to do something different. Or if you're treating a stricture predominant disease, you place stents and the stricture is just not resolving. You place a 10 print stent, take out the stent, the stricture is still the same. And then that, that can be considered as a failure of endotherapy. So what I'm saying is if once when you do endotherapy, you should have endpoints of treatment. And if you don't have endpoints, I don't think you should start endotherapy. So that so takes to, about a year to take a decision. Yes, approximately okay. about a year, you should give a trial and reach that end point. Now, if you are not reaching that end point, if you are just keeping on treating those patients of stones, you just can't clear the duct. All the time patient comes with pain, repeated episodes, you can't just keep on placing stents. You have to do something for a more permanent treatment. So surgery is better. The last question to Dr. Roop is, how do you get your patients to stop smoking and alcohol? I mean, we, we find this as a huge problem. So what is your strategy to actually make it successful? So uh, stop uh, stopping alcohol is much easier than stopping smoking. I mean, if you talk to the patient, well, they do stop alcohol, but smoking is very, very difficult. So uh, naturally, a good counseling is important. Sometimes I ask them to take some nicotine gums for a short term and then taper off. And I don't ask them to stop smoking immediately. Like in, I, I just, they should reduce the numbers and over a brief period of time, they should. So, so that's how I counsel them. But again, this depends on the physician who's treating the patient. They may have different strategies, but uh, yes, uh, smoking cessation is difficult, I must say. Radhir, next session, would you want to take up? Yeah. Are we continuing with that? The... No, I think if you have no questions, we can go to the next session. Or others, yes. if there's anything. That's no, what we, we should go to the panel we discussion. Maybe the questions for more can be discussion. answered there. Am I right, Pramod? Uh, we should go to the panel discussion. Yeah, so first of all, let me thank all the uh, 
uh, speakers in the in this uh, session. Uh, Dr. Rajneesh, Professor of uh, GI Surgery at SGPGI. Dr. Saluja is a Professor of GI Surgery at GIPAN. Uh, Roop Jyoti, everybody knows, Senior Gastroenterologist AIG. And Dr. Deepak Gunjan, who is a young budding pancreatologist from AIMS. So I think having made, having made the session very, very interesting. And Dr. Medev, who has talked extensively on endoscopic therapy. So thank you all very much for this session. Uh, I would request that uh, if you don't have any other pressing engagement, all these speakers and, and, and uh, chairperson, please stay on uh, so that you can answer any of the questions uh, raised during the panel discussion. So uh, uh, let me now uh, go to the, uh, to the panel discussion and I'm happy to have a galaxy of uh, experts. Dr. Sudipta Dhar Chaudhary, you all know, is a professor of gastroenterology at uh, at uh, CMC Vellore. Uh, professor Raju Sharma, who is a professor of uh, radio diagnosis at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and uh, one of our star um, radiologists. And Dr. G.V. Rao, uh, who all, you, all you, you know has done extensive work on pancreatitis from AIG. So thank you all very much for joining in. Uh, this is a case-based discussion that we are going to yeah, have promote. very practical. Yes, please. Yeah, Pramod, I think yeah, uh, Rajneesh, Sandeep, and Adesh have also decided yeah, to yeah. speak back. Yes, yes so, so, so I have, have actually requested all of discussion. them to be uh, on the panel. So yes. I'm going to ask some of the questions. Right, yes. thank you. So straight away, we'll go to a case. This is a 50-year-old patient, uh, male patient presented with pain for two months. He had occasional vomitings, anorexia, and weight loss, and recently detected to have diabetes. So at this juncture, uh, let me ask our medical gastroenterologist Sudipta, what will be the differential diagnosis someone coming in with pain, anorexia, weight loss, and recently detected diabetes? Sudip, Sudipta. Yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, considering the uh, history of abdominal pain for two months, a uh, worsening pain and occasional vomiting, more importantly is the recent detection of diabetes. I would consider the diagnosis of a possible pancreatic cancer in an uh, in a individual. So, 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 yeah, yeah, that, that's one. Uh, that's one. Suppose uh, there is the no diabetes. Is not, if there's no underlying diabetes, then of course the other differential diagnosis for abdominal pain definitely come in, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. Right. So any, uh, any other cause of abdominal pain in this Such as malignant gastric ulcer and other things. Gastric, gastric ulcer, ga uh, gastroparesis, diabetes. Uh, hello. So, right. uh, any the gallbladder stones, any other causes of acute abdominal pain or chronic abdominal pain can come into this differentials. Right. But the reason I put in diabetes here is that uh, this is for the audience that anybody who comes in where you suspect it could be a malignant disease and patient is recently detected diabetic for two months, three months, six months, one year, then uh, do consider pancreatic cancer in such a situation. If, and many times what happens is the lesion is small and you can't really pick up on, on imaging, but you have to keep looking for it. Now, importantly, in this patient, there was a history, past history of recurrent abdominal pain for 10 years. He had been diagnosed as having chronic pancreatitis, treated medically. In fact, he was pain-free for about seven years. So this is also uh, not uncommon that patients have disease for going on for about 10 years or so. Then they were burnt out disease. And in such a patient, if they come back with pain, uh, he was a non-alcoholic and non-smoker then what will your differential diagnosis be? So in this circumstances, the diagnosis becomes much more uh, sinister, sir, because in the background of a chronic pancreatitis who has been medically quite stable and with a recent worsening of pain and a recent diabetes mellitus, I would strongly suspect that this patient might be having an underlying pancreatic cancer in the background of chronic pancreatitis. So what are the conditions apart from this new onset of pain that you would consider a patient as having uh, CA in addition to underlying chronic pancreatitis. Uh, sorry, sir, I didn't get the question, sir. So sorry. in addition to having a new onset of pain, what yes, are sir. the other indications yeah. that you will think patient has developed uh, complications so, so, of cancer? So one is that a recent history of weight loss, recent diabetes mellitus, worsening abdominal pain. These are the sinister signs that a person might be having an underlying pancreatic malignancy. So recent onset of pain, worsening of pain, biliary obstruction, anorexia and weight loss. Yes, sir. Right? Also, can I make a comment, Pramod? Yes, yes, please. Also a patient who's a diabetic and suddenly his diabetes control goes haywire. Right. For no obvious reasons. I mean, that is a very sensitive sign. 
Am I right? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Very, very important point. Yes. yes. Sir. Very good. So obviously in situation like this, uh, we will consider um, that patient has got uh, uh, chronic pancreatitis with likely a, a mass lesion. Then what do we do next? Uh, Sudipta, uh, if you could I, tell I, us what yes, would sir. be an uh, in investigative uh, approach here. In this circumstances, I prefer to go ahead straight with a cross-sectional imaging of the abdomen, and that would be going ahead straight with a CT scan. If CT offered, scan. A CT scan. Ultrasound okay. abdomen has a very poor sensitivity if you were looking for a small lesion of the pancreas. Upper J endoscopy, obviously, as you said, is normal. So I'll straight ahead go ahead with a cross-sectional imaging of the pancreas. Okay. So before I bring in Dr. Raju Sharma, uh, let me ask Dr. Rao, what is, what 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 investigation would you like if a patient comes to you straight as a surgeon? What investigations would you like? I would go by a cross-sectional imaging, a CCT with the pancreas protocol, actually. That would be the ideal thing, actually. Okay. Uh, Dr. Raju like Sharma, this, if you could just uh, tell us uh, that uh, uh, if someone asked uh, you that uh, this is a patient with chronic pancreatitis with likely CA pancreas, would CT be your uh, first investigation or do you like to do something else? I think I would agree that a contrast enhanced, a good quality pancreatic protocol CT is the way to go. But uh, having said that, I would add that uh, in, uh, some of these patients, we would need an MR as well, uh, because it does offer some additive information for a good. Okay. So you Pramod, can tell us about this patient CT, if you, if Pramod, you just tell us the comment. audience, Pramod, uh, what is it to find here? I think Dr. Ad is going to say something. Pramod, yeah. uh, for the benefit of the audience, does it not make sense to say that first we should do an ultrasound? Suppose we have a patient in whom there is ascites, multiple liver metastasis, you don't need to do a CT scan first. So I will invariably, like you said, you had written an ultrasound, but it's better to emphasize this fact that an ultrasound, Raju also will agree, GB will agree, that once in a while you get a patient, he shows ascites, multiple liver metastasis, you don't need to go any further investigation on this patient. I think that completely agree with that, yes, sure. So, Dr. Raju Sharma, if you could just enlighten us about the findings here. Okay, so this is a non-contrast uh, image where we have a focus of uh, calcification in the region of the uh, pancreatic head. And uh, the other uh, scan that you have given is a contrast image at a more uh, level as compared to the first one. And that shows a hypodense lesion in the region of the neck and the proximal body of the pancreas. Uh, which is hypodense and shows some peripheral uh, enhancement. And uh, trying to put two images, sir, there would be a strong suspicion that uh, in a patient of chronic calcific pancreatitis, there's probably a developing uh, coma in the background. Would like to see more images. So you said you will do us uh, MR. What will you find on MR? MR uh, scan. What additional information you will get? Uh Especially when the lesion is located in the region of the head of the pancreas, then there is this distinction that one needs to make from the entity of and chronic pancreatitis. And that's something that's not been stressed in the discussion so far, that uh, on imaging, at least mass forming chronic pancreatitis plays havoc because it mimics pancreatic cancer very, very closely. And then the detailed morphology helps us a lot when we look at the CP images in detail because uh, the duct penetrates the inflammatory masses and reaches up to the ampulla. Whereas uh, when there is a carcinoma present, it causes duct off, and the duct usually does not penetrate that mass. And this duct penetrating sign helps us a lot. In addition, using MR, we can do uh, some other paradigms for characterization, which include diffusion-weighted imaging, where if you have marked restriction of diffusion in the lesion, then your uh, diagnosis tends to favor pancreatic malignancy rather than an inflammatory mass. So a simple question so is, this suppose is a Suppose a CT has go shown ahead. you clearly a mass and you are happy with that. Would you go ahead with MR or you are fine with CT alone? No, I wouldn't go ahead with MR then. If I can okay. make out that uh, if you are on CT that the pancreatic head is healthy, but it is mass forming chronic pancreatitis, I would not. Only if the CT is equivocal would I suggest that uh, MR should also be done. Okay, that's, that's very good. Anna. Now the next issue is that sometimes clinicians would ask for a PET CT. Now, you have a CT which shows you a definite mass. The setting is of chronic pancreatitis. We suspect it is malignancy. Is there a point going for a PET CT here? 
I don't think so. And maybe in pancreatitis uh, and pancreatic cancer coexist in the same patient. That is one of the hardest diagnoses to make uh, for a radiologist at least, and for I presume for the gastroenterologist as well. And in then we really rely on a combination of modalities rather than, because no single modality gives all the answers. And you uh, patients, you may land up using a combination of modalities as has probably been done in this patient where you have a PET CT showing you a very, very FDG avid uh, lesion. This, uh, the pre-mark was showing contrast enhanced MR, which was showing a hypo intense mass in the region of the neck. And then on PET, if you see this kind of FDG uptake, it would strongly favor a pancreatic. So, so let me, let me ask surgeons, would they like to do a PET CT before, before they take up this patient for surgery? If the CT shows a definite mass. Dr. Rao? Dr. G. V. Rao? Dr. Adar Chaudhary? Okay. Uh, I will not routinely do a PET scan, but there's a subgroup of patients in whom CA19-9 is very high, or a CT scan shows there are multiple large lymph nodes. In those patients, selectively, I might do a PET scan, but routinely, I do not do a PET scan for a patient who's got an indeterminate mass in the head of pancreas. Okay, fair enough. So we move on. Uh, do you need any other investigation, for example, an EUS or FNA, given this case? Dr. G. V. Rao? I'm not sure he's, he's with us. Or... Dr. Adha Chaudhary? Rajneesh? I, uh, uh, Rajneesh wants to answer it. Rajneesh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, the question was about any other investigation in this yeah, particular patient. You have a CT which shows a lesion. Mm -hmm. You have a PET CT mm -hmm. which shows a lesion. Do you want a, a EUS or FNA or something before you go in with surgery? So, so the, the, the crux of the question really is that is the lesion resectable? I haven't had the opportunity to look at it very carefully, but from what I saw, I think there are some celiac axis invasion reported, if I'm not wrong. So if so it is resectable, there will be no pathology required beyond this. But, uh, and I'm planning to operate, that is, if I'm not planning to operate, then definitely uh, for subsequent treatment and uh, uh, whether it is palliative or new adjuvant, I would need to have a US FNAC. So if there is no plan for new adjuvant, would you like a FNA or you will go ahead with no, surgery? No pathology required if the radiology is convincing, yes. Any, any, any uh, other opinion, Dr. Chaudhary? Yep. Uh, no. Sir, uh, uh, as, as sir said, if the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sir. Yes, go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, new when yeah. the imaging is consistent with a cancer, we do not need a tissue acquisition. Yeah, absolutely. When it's very resectable, we don't need it. But if you have an atypical mass at imaging or you have a borderline resectable, then I think we definitely need an EUS guided FNAC. Okay. GB, you have any different opinion on that? No, no absolutely right. Actually, what absolutely. actually, if it's so, a resectable lesion, I think that there is no biopsy is required actually. So I think this is very, very important because what is happening nowadays is anybody has a pancreatic head mass, you think it is likely to be malignant. Still, you know, uh, patients are being sent for EUS and repeated FNA. One FNA is negative. You send for another FNA. Then you say FNA biopsy. So I think the message should be loud and clear that in a patient in whom you suspect it is likely to be malignant, there is no need for a tissue diagnosis unless somebody is planning a new adjuvant chemotherapy. Right? Actually, Pramod, I just have one to say actually. Yeah. Suppose if it is not acceptable and you're taking a biopsy, this is one word of caution that I just wanted to tell the endocrinologist. We have to specify where the needle is striking in from because see, either you do it from the prepyloric area or you're doing it from the duodenum. In a lesion like this, I think obviously you would go with the needle in the prepyloric region. This would determine the type of resection, if at all, it has to be done. So we would be very happy if the endosonologists tell us where is the site of the needle puncture. So this, I think this is a, a, again a very, very important point, what you have made, that if you have a lesion in the head of pancreas, the FNA is done from the duodenum. But yes. if there is a lesion in the body and tail of the pancreas, we have to go transgastric. And but, there is obviously a risk for, for seedling. Yeah, but the, sometimes it happens that they take it from the prepyloric region, suppose for some reason. You understand actually? So I, I think it. it's it's a very good thing that actually the endocrinologists have to tell us where the needle puncture is so that the subsequent surgery, if at all, patient is planned for surgery, we can plan for I agree. That's a good point. Yes. So in general, the starting point in a patient who has got a head mass with or without chronic pancreatitis that we should take it as cancer unless 
otherwise there are two surgical series uh, one in which uh, patients underwent whipples and they found only about 10% were benign disease another series where eus was also included in the pre operative workup of 494 patients 7% turned out to be benign disease so the point here is that in a patient in whom you suspect clinically it is likely to be malignant you can go ahead without fna and only about 7 to 10% patients will turn out to have benign disease and in majority of them also a surgical procedure uh, will be warranted otherwise for pain relief as as such so the the question is when do we suspect it is likely to be benign and surgery may not be required of course sometimes we have patients who are young who have prolonged history of fever you have a cystic lesion rather than a solid lesion the entire pancreas is bulky where you suspect that it could be autoimmune pancreatitis and if the mpd is not dilated so these are some of the from the pointers clinically where you may suspect it is unlikely to be malignant and you may go ahead and do fna coming to the second case this is a 40 year 42 year old male he has pain for 6 months frequent pain almost you know continuous kind of pain he developed jaundice two weeks back he had weight loss but there was no fever he was a chronic alcoholic and smoker now situpta so if a patient comes to you like this uh, what is it that uh, you will think and how will you evaluate so so uh, the thing is that uh, here the we have to look at the red flags here the red flags in this gentleman is jaundice for two weeks weight loss in a patient with a background of uh, smoking so this is one these are the three red flags this this gentleman has jaundice weight loss and smoking and all of which actually are pointers that he might be having an underlying chronic pancreatitis and which of course in the background of jaundice we would suspect that this is probably we're looking at either a inflammatory more likely a neoplastic structure of the bile duct probably a chronic pancreatitis and a underlying pancreatic cancer producing an obstruction of the bile duct but it is also possible he doesn't have pancreatitis he may just be having ca pancreas i mean he is <laughs> having a ca pancreas also that's, right. that's possible Straight. that's also possible sir <laughs> right okay sure the only thing is his age is against it he's only 42 and 42 is rather unusual for for having ca pancreas straight away his ct actually was done which showed that he has chronic calcipancreatitis but with an enlarged head of pancreas and ca 99 was 90 international units what would you do next so again sir if the ct is uh, again here sir there is a chronic calcific pancreatitis and there is an enlarged head mass so here possibility what we are seeing is a elevated ca99 borderline elevation with a mass lesion if this lesion is not typical of a pancreatic cancer then we would probably prefer, uh, prefer to do an ultrasound aegis guided fnac of the lesion okay and in this patient ct had shown this mass but we were not sure it is likely to be malignant and here comes the role of radiologist again because in a situation like this he is a young patient he is alcoholic he has pancreatitis whether the mass is malignant or or inflammatory i think this is the classical conundrum where we don't know what we are dealing with so i'll bring in dr raju sharma here to tell us how would he evaluate patients who have got uh, who have got uh, chronic pancreatitis with a bulky head of pancreas dr raju sharma let me use this patient to uh, highlight the situation this was a case that we saw just last week where a uh, patient had a similar history of abdomen and loss of weight and uh, we saw a markedly dilated uh, pancreatic duct with a of the uh, pancreatic parenchyma and uh, the head was bulky you can see the head is bulky these are the mesenteric vessels and uh, so we were not sure looking at this is this pancreatitis is this a head mass like a neoplastic mass in the head and we went ahead and did an mr because there was a solid mass in the head with marked pancreatic duct dilatation when we look at the mp of this image it shows that there is a smooth narrowing in the common bile duct in the lower third suggestive of fine fracture in the common bile duct there is a markedly dilated pancreatic duct but if you look at this the arrow points to the part where the narrow duct is traversing the head now this uh, led us to uh, believe that this is more likely to be and in tree mass more like mass forming chronic pancreatitis the duct is not getting cut off the duct is actually penetrating that uh, mass lesion and the uh, second part of the duodenum it's almost reaching up to the uh, ampulla and uh, so this is what duct penetrating sign is and if you promote if you can show the next slide i'll show that with another example that uh, this is another patient who has a bulky head mass with uh, multiple foci of pancreatic calcification and there are these hypodense areas Again, you would be worried. Is there a pancreatic 
can be seen also in the background of chronic calcific pancreatitis. And here again, if you see the uh, dilated pancreatic duct, it is traversing the pancreatic head and almost reaching up to the ancula. Here we also add diffusion-weighted imaging, which showed us that there was no restriction. These are high B images, and I won't have the time to go into the physics, but if the lesion is not bright on a diffusion-weighted image, it's so there's no restriction. And this combination of duct penetration, along with the absence of diffusion restriction, uh, to us uh, suggested that this was more likely to be forming chronic pancreatitis and not pancreatic malignancy. I'll contrast that with this image, where you have this isodense, very subtle uh, lesion in the region of the neck of the pancreas, causing upstream depression of the pancreatic duct in the pancreas with pancreatic atrophy. And this duct is getting cut off. If you, on CT itself, you can make out that the duct is not penetrating the station. You look at the MRC and you have a cutoff. You have a double duct sign that we typically talk of. And the pancreatic duct is getting off. It is not penetrating that mass station. This is what pancreatic carcinomas tend to do, that they cut off the pancreatic duct and do not allow the duct to penetrate through the mass station. Following the duct is absolutely critical when you see a dilated duct. This was a patient who was seen in February 2008. This duct was mildly dilated. The duct was mildly dilated. It was ignored and not picked up. And uh, later, when the patient came back, about eight months later, there was a large mass sitting here, which was causing this duct cutoff. Now, if in retrospect, if we look at this image, one should have suspected that there is a very small pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which was clearly resectable at this time. This time. So duct, following the duct up to the ampulla is very critical when you're seeing a dilated duct of this uh, ductal uh, cutoff or duct penetrating sign. This is another patient of mass forming chronic pancreatitis showing similar findings. I'll just use this image, uh, if you can go to the next slide, to show what uh, carcinoma is like on a diffusion weighted image. Now, if we can go back to this slide. From yeah, so you have on this T2 weighted axial image, you have this mildly hyper intense mass in the region of the pancreatic head. On MRCP, the duct is dilated not penetrating that lesion in the head. This is a diffusion image, and you can see how bright this lesion is on the diffusion image, which suggests that this is a cellular lesion, a very densely cellular lesion, is uh, more in favor of a malignancy, which is what this was proved to be on an EUS-guided uh, thing. So uh, the combination of an MRCP showing you dark penetration along with diffusion-weighted imaging is the useful uh, information that MR can provide. The patient that Pramod showed in the first case, where you have a focus of pancreatic calcification, you have a hypodense mass in the region of the proximal body of pancreas, which is, of course, causing vascular encasement of the superior mesenchymal artery. That's the MR image showing you a hypovascular mass. And this, again, is the uh, diffusion-weighted image and the reversed grayscale. So here, the mass looks hypo-intense. We have just done this to bring the mass out better and make it easier to visualize. This, again, showed marked restriction of diffusion this was a malignancy coexisting with chronic calcific pancreatitis. So in short, the duct is the most important. Is the duct traversing through the mass likely benign? Duct is obstructed by the mass is likely malignant because more than 90% of carcinoma are ductal adenocarcinoma arising from the duct. Thank you very much. That's very, very- Can I ask a question to oh, Professor? Yes, okay. please. Can I, I... Yes. Yeah, you know, what is the role of perfusion CT scan today in, in differentiating mass forming chronic pancreatitis from carcinoma pancreas? So, we've done some work on this in our institution with Pramod. And uh, so, what uh, we found and what's also shown in literature is that although both pancreatic carcinomas and mass forming chronic pancreatitis are hypovascular lesions, but uh, the degree of reduction of blood flow is much greater in pancreatic cancer. And using perfusion CT, you can actually quantify that because we can calculate blood flow and blood volume. And these are reduced in both, but the degree of reduction is more, more pancreatic carcinoma as compared to MMP. However, it is still in the domain of uh, research and studies. I don't think anyone uses it as a routine clinical tool. It's cumbersome too, but uh, hopefully allergy, this will become a part of routine imaging as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sudipta, this patient, uh, we were not sure whether it is malignant or, or benign on, yeah. on cross-sectional imaging. So what mm -hmm. would you do next? Because it's a young patient, like, unlikely to be malignant. What would you do next? Would you do EUS or something else? So, uh, sir, as I uh, said, I would, I would prefer to go with EUS primarily because, okay, despite the findings on the MRI, one thing which is really alarming is jaundice. For us, 
whenever we see a, a patient with jaundice, more likely we have seen that it, invariably there is a malignancy harboring somewhere there, despite it showing some inflammatory changes too. Having said this, I would prefer to go with the EUS. Okay. So oh, nowadays EUS, we have two things that we can easily do. One is contrast enhance EUS, the other is uh, elastography. And then of course we can do FNA uh, in cases where it is suspected. In this particular patient, uh, we actually went and did uh, uh, EUS with, with the contrast enhancement. And you can see here, this is the head of pancreas. You can see multiple calculi here. These are calculi here, the duct is dilated. And uh, this is the head of pancreas, which was enlarged. We thought on, on EUS that it is likely to be inflammatory because we could not see any discrete mass lesion. And most of the time we are able to see the duct traversing through the mass if it is benign. So if you see this is on the image on the right side is after giving wow. contrast and you will soon see that uh, this uh, lesion lights up on, on the contrast. You can see the bubbles coming in here and this suggested that it is likely to be inflammatory More like rather than a malignant <laughs> mass. Correct. And if you see here on this left side, there seems to be a mass, but uh, FNA showed it to be a benign uh, disease. And head was enlarged, CBD dilated, calcification, MPD was seen coursing through the mass and FNA showed inflammatory mass. So the issue here is that patients, uh, many patients with chronic pancreatitis come with CP and, and a mass lesion. How do we find out what is... Uh, uh, the, the case here, whether it is malignant or benign. Uh, we did a couple of studies. Uh, one is a prospective study where we wanted to see chronic pancreatitis risk factor for CA pancreas of 402 patients, mean age was 29 years and uh, majority were males. And what we found was that uh, 57 patients uh, uh, presented with a mass lesion out of around 4,000 person years. Malignancy was suspected in 31 of these patients five patients were ultimately diagnosed to have pancreatic cancer. So out of 57, those who had mass, uh, less than 10% actually were diagnosed to have pancreatic cancer. Majority didn't have pancreatic cancer. And the important thing was mean interf interval from onset of pancreatitis to development of cancer was about 16 years. So that's an important point to remember. Four had idiopathic chronic pancreatitis, one had hereditary pancreatitis, and none had alcoholic pancreatitis. That's again important. And the second study we, we did was a case control study to find out the risk factors for pancreatic cancer of 249 patients with pancreatic cancer and 1,000 healthy controls. And we found 24 of these 249 patients had underlying chronic pancreatitis. And interestingly, again, all had idiopathic chronic pancreatitis. So in both the cohort and the case control study, we found that none of the patients who had alcoholic chronic pancreatitis developed uh, pancreatic cancer. This was rather interesting. And we thought, why it is so? The reason we believe it is so is a time lag. Chronic inflammation to cancer takes a long time. In our series, it was 16 years. And we know many other diseases, for example, uh, cirrhosis with cancer, uh, esophageal uh, cancer in, in, in the setting of Barrett's esophagus, IBD to cancer, minimum of 10 years will be the time lag. And this is what happens is, the alcoholic pancreatitis, the mean is 38 years. If at all they will develop cancer, they will do so at the age of 55 to 60 years. It is not present in those who present with short history of six months to one year or so. So patients with alcoholic, who are alcoholics may develop de novo CA pancreas. Like in this patient, initially Sudipta said, we don't know whether he has chronic pancreatitis or not clinically, but he can surely develop CA pancreas directly. Or the patient may develop chronic pancreatitis with a mean age of 38 to 40 years. And from here, they may, they may develop CA pancreas, but it will take at least 15 to 20 years. So the point here is when a patient comes to us at this stage, for, with a history of one year, two years, it is highly unlikely that he has CP leading to CA pancreas, right? And that's the reason we didn't find in our patients. This. So Ritha, uh, this so, brings me to another issue that patients with chronic pancreatitis uh, may develop CA What's the role of surveillance? Do we do surveillance? Yes or no? If yes, what's the high risk group? What modalities? So first thing is that I don't think so. We have really a protocol for surveillance in chronic pancreatitis for, for looking for pancreatic cancer. 
If you ask which is the high risk group for pancreatic cancer, any patient with a family history of chronic pancreatitis or a family history of pancreatic cancer, these are the groups which you would consider to be high risk for pancreatic cancer. And these are the patients which we usually screen for chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. But the screening is actually not a protocolized pancreatic cancer for our center. What we do is an ultrasound abdomen and a yearly CA-99. But that, uh, that's about it. We really do not have a particular protocol for this, sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. G. V. Rao, uh, let me ask you, if the second patient that I showed, he has got chronic pancreatitis with an inflammatory mass, he presents to you, we, we say there is no malignancy and he has got significant pain. What would you do? Would you go for surgery or would you say no surgery? I think this patient, because of his age, I think this patient, I think I would uh, strongly suggest him surgery. I think uh, because there is no suspicion of any malignancy in this, actually, I think I would strongly suggest this patient uh, that he has to undergo surgery in the form of a uh, brace procedure. So I think I, this is a very, very important point that patients with chronic pancreatitis who present with continuous chronic pain and an inflammatory head mass, even these patients, I think the best form of treatment is surgical. Dr. Chaudhary, would you agree with that or not? Uh, uh, absolutely, I agree, I think, but uh, the, uh, uh, these patients are, uh, if managed early head masses, the role of endotherapy and all is poor, so you should have a lesser threshold for surgery in these patients. So, Dr. Rao, if we have to do surgery, what would be the timing? The patient are presented with pain, he has got inflammatory head mass. When would you like to do surgery and what type of surgery? So, the, see, the intervention for this, uh, see, there is a lot of data to show right now. Uh, be it the, for early intervention is better in these patients. Actually, we have a lot of data coming in to show that early intervention is better. So, if the patient is symptomatic, I don't think, uh, I think we straight away uh, suggest them surgery. Uh, I don't think in a, in a patient who's got an inflammatory mass, I don't think we should try unless and until we want to stabilize the patient for some other reason. Uh, I think we should straight away consider them for surgery. But does active inflammation uh, present some problem to you during surgery? Uh, see, in an inflammatory mass, I don't think we'll have a complete resolution of inflammation. Actually, Adesh will agree with me. Actually, inflammation is not a contraindication for any surgical intervention, especially when we have an inflammatory mass, actually. Uh, understand until the patient has got some very pancreatic fluid collections. You understand actually, but otherwise, I don't think it's a contraindication for surgery. Any other opinion, Surgeon Dr. Rajesh? Uh, is Rajesh Singh is there? Sandeep Saluja? Uh, I don't differ uh, with, the, with the two senior uh, surgeons, but there is a small subset of patients where the surgeon does get worried, especially when on a CT scan you see a lot of fat standing. Patient has recently had a flare of pain. So while I agree that we should operate as early as possible, but sometimes it's prudence to wait for a few weeks to manage the pain uh, and let him uh, settle down for a couple of weeks or maybe a month and then operate that patient. But okay, I, I, in principle, I agree with the fact that there is no real reason, reason to wait. Sandeep? Sir, uh, basically, Dr. G. V. Rao correctly pointed out if the CT is showing any changes of recent evidence of acute pancreatitis, in form of any fluid collections. Otherwise, these patients actually we will operate because this inflammation is a recurrent process. You don't know, once the patient is not having any significant signs of acute pancreatitis, we operate these patients. Uh, so, I, this patient uh, presented with jaundice, would you like to do uh, endoscopic stenting before you operate or you would like to take up uh, directly, Dr. Rao? I think, again, uh, this is a point of discussion. Actually, if the jaundice is not very high, the patient does not have a cholangitis. Okay, I'll put it this way. If the patient does not have any cholangitis, I think we can take the patient for surgery directly. If the patient any has cholangitis, I think we can take an indication for preoperative drainage, but the patient does not have any cholangitis, I think we can take them for surgery directly. Uh, can I make an alternative point? Slightly yeah, different... Yeah. Uh, just to, uh, I agree with Dr. Roy uh, exactly, but there is a point to having a cholangiogram before you operate. So MR, even if it was not done earlier, MRCP would be good because the way you would deal with that, uh, with that biliary structure would depend to a certain extent on the MR, which means to say that if you have cored the head and you're going to rely only on the coring for relieving the structure, then you need an intraoperative cholangiogram or else you need to do a, a biliary yeah. drainage procedure along uh, with the... Uh, uh, Rajneesh, I think uh, I will not agree with you on this. Sorry. 
So uh, I think you'll have to nearly always separately drain the bile duct. We theoretically talk by coring, you can open the bile duct. It rarely happens. I agree it's, with that, sir. It's much safer to do a, a It was more of a textbook teaching rather than anything yeah, yeah, else. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think we should do a proper procedure. And what Pramod asked is a very relevant question. If patient has active pain, it is best not to operate at that time. We should let the pain subside and then operate because pain means that there is active peripancreatic edema and that's what GV meant. We should let the pain settle unless there are some patients in whom pain never settles. That's different. But it's better to wait because that's a difficult surgery. Dr. Chaudhary, I have one question, what Sandeep Saluja mentioned, and which is important that if, suppose this patient has portal vein obstruction with collaterals, how would it affect your surgical plan? Okay. Uh, one of the most important things is to prognosticate it to the patient's attendance before surgery, that it may not be possible to successfully do this procedure. This is very important. Normally, we do not need blood transfusion in this surgery, but in such patients, I'll always arrange blood. Third thing is that a presence of collaterals is not an absolute contraindication for surgery. Though surgery is difficult, it may not be possible, but we should not outrightly reject these patients. Many times you can get away with uh, doing a procedure in these patients. If you and have if a shuntable you, vein, for example, no, we, don't do, vein is we don't do shunts in these patients. This is a left-sided portal hypertension. We do a spinectomy along with the uh, uh, drainage procedure or head coring. No, no, I'm saying there is a portal vein obstruction, but the splenic vein is patent. It happens in some patients. Oh, you have a splenic vein patent. It rarely happens for both. Uh, chronic pancreatitis, majority 99% of time, splenic vein is thrombosed. Okay. I don't think I have ever done a shunt for a patient of chronic pancreatitis. Okay. But and it is very, very difficult to isolate the splenic vein in patients with chronic pancreatitis and do a shunt. You agree with me, others? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. very, very, oh. very good. Thank you. So, so I think the point here is that majority of patients who have chronic pain, who have recurrent pain, if they have a hand inflammatory head mass, I think surgical treatment is best uh, rather than uh, 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 endoscopic therapy. And if you cannot rule out malignancy, would you do a would you do a phrase or you'll go ahead with ripples? Rao, Dr. G. V. Rao. I, I, I see. I, I think in a patient, what you've shown actually that is an ideal case. Look like it's it's a good case for phrase procedure. I think, uh, I think if you're having this patient the, like this, I think uh, you'll For go. example, the practice in US has been to do Whipple's rather than uh, a phrase procedure. Is that correct? That's very correct, Pramod, because they have a great bias against doing head curing because they think it's a European procedure. Yeah. But the only indication of doing Whipple's in chronic pancreatitis, if you cannot reliably exclude malignancy. Okay. So, so you don't want us to, to poke a needle again and again to say whether this is benign or malignant. Uh, if you think it, we cannot decide it's benign or malignant, straight away go ahead with pancreatinectomy. Is that what you're saying? If it's a resectable lesion and you we strongly suspect malignancy in a fit patient in a high volume center with a good surgeon, possibly it might be better to do a pancreatinectomy because if it's cancer, it treats and it's a fantastic way to relieve pain but patient does pay a price for Whipple's procedure. Okay, but one of the problems is that if you do Whipple's in these patients, they, if they are not diabetic to begin with, they, they become diabetic. If they're diabetic to begin with, the diabetes may get worse, but which is, which is something that is kind of a trade-off. Okay, thank you. I think with this, we will finish uh, our uh, formal discussion. So let me summarize by saying that new onset of pain, worsening pain, weight loss, anorexia, diabetes and which becomes difficult to manage and idiopathic pancreatitis, which is likely genetic, we should suspect if there is a mass, it is likely malignant. In patients who are alcoholic, who present to us with a short history of one, two, three years, it is likely to be inflammatory, particularly if you find the duct is traversing through the mass and we see calcification within the mass, likely to be inflammatory. And this is what a study have shown. And if you're in doubt, I think these patients needs to be operated. So uh, with this, we will formally close this final discussion. If there are comments, I'll be happy to, to have comments from, from all, all, all our uh, panelists. Hmm. Sudipta, no, sir. Raju Sharma and Dr. Rao. No, sir. Thank you so much, sir.
Very well moderated, Pramod. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Very well done, Pramod. Very well done. Very and actually, good. the cross-sectional imaging pictures were excellent, actually, from Dr. Raju Sharma, actually. Beautiful pictures you have shown, actually. Thank you. Roop Jyoti, you are still here. You can make some comments. Roop, if you could make some comments. I think I was muted. Yeah. Regarding the diagnosis of a suspected mass, I think diabetes is very important. And as Dr. Adarsh Chaudhary said, a patient who is already having diabetes, if the diabetes goes hayward, it's a very important red flag. So that needs to be considered. And uh, regarding uh, FNA, yes, of course, uh, if there is a definite uh, malignancy uh, or malignant appearing mass which requires surgery, FNA biopsy may not be needed, but again, for neoadjuvant therapy, biopsy is important. PET CT has its own uh, flip side, so again, it should be used with caution, especially in the background of chronic pancreatitis. Dr. Naresh Bhatt, do you have any comments to make? The only question was when you have an inflammatory mass, uh, I think what we do is that we, as we buy time to get the pain, uh, inflammation set down, we typically put a nasojejunal tube and sit on them for a couple of weeks. And a lot of time it does settle down. And okay, very rarely do we have to really consider an early surgical option. Right, thank you. Deepak, do you have any, any comments, last minute comments to make? Sir, uh, I just want to highlight that if a patient has chronic calcific pancreatitis with head mass and calcifications in the head, then for endosonologists, it's very difficult to differentiate because calcification does cause lots of artifacts. And even if it is pancreatic malignancy, it's very difficult to diagnose in these settings. So I think, again, Deepak, you have made an excellent point because all the endosonologists will tell you that you give us a patient and we'll tell you it's malignant or not. And uh, multiple studies have shown that it's very difficult actually to differentiate between malignancy and, uh, and, and non-neoplastic inflammatory. All the surgeons are smiling when I say that endosonologists will make such a tall claim. So thank you very much for, for bringing this point. So, uh, and that is why I discussed that in case you're not sure whether it is malignant or benign, I think it's best to hand over the patient to surgeons and they will decide what kind of surgery will they do. Uh, on this note, I thank you all very much for participating in this panel discussion and for giving talks in this uh, very important webinar. Thank you all very much. Have a, a very happy and healthy new year and may all you get vaccinated uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Bye.